Okay, MM Hotep family, you're tuning into the Pro Black Perspective on KWAZ Radio, and I'm your host, Onitase Kumat, and I implore you to check out the other programs on the KWAZ Radio Network, including The Learning Curve with Revolutionary Matron, The Bitter Medicine Podcast, and of course, The Harsh Reality Podcast. And, and make sure you subscribe. I was actually just on The Harsh Reality Podcast. Uh, program. I think he's going to upload his present series later. And when he does, you're going to hear a pretty damn good uh, interview. You know, one of the things you really have to realize is that interviews work. They work better when the tool, the interviewer is good. You know, it works better when the interviewer is good. So make sure you check this out because this is a good interviewer. Right. Uh, but of course, without further ado, let's jump right into the program. Uh, I'm a little bit uh, late. Kofi's here. Kofi says greetings. Revolutionary Matron is here. She said greetings. Uh, so greetings to the both of you. Um, and I'm going to just get into it. Let's see. Uh, I believe I read this. Yeah, I read this because I tried to read the first thing on the next on the last page. Right. So we go to this. It says, we should not, therefore, be content to delve into the people's past to find concrete examples to counter colonialism's endeavors to distort and depreciate. We must work and struggle and step with the people so as to shape the future and appear the, appear the grounds where vigorous shoots. Hold on a second. I thought I just heard something. Uh, all right. We must work and struggle and step with the people so as to shape the future and prepare the ground where vigorous shoots are already sprouting. National culture is no folklore where an abstract populism is convinced it has uncovered the popular truth. It is not some congealed mass of noble gestures, in other words, less and less connected with the reality of the people. National culture is the collective thought process of a people to describe, justify, and extol the actions whereby they have joined forces and remain strong. National culture in the underdeveloped countries, therefore, must lie at the very heart of the liberation struggle these countries are waging. The African intellectuals who are still fighting in the name of Negro African culture and who continue to organize conferences dedicated to the unity of that culture should realize that they can do little more than compare coins and sarcophagi, right? So that's actually pretty interesting, kind of a little bit demeaning, right? Uh, this national culture is the undeveloped uh, countries, therefore, must lie at the very heart of the liberation struggle. So here's what it is. So he's saying this, right? And, and some of you might agree. Um, I don't, but some of you may agree. And, and what he's saying is that, you know, culture is not anything pre-colonial at this point. Okay? Your culture is not pre-colonial. Your culture is present. Okay? Your culture is present day. And it has its merits. You know, in, in the same way, in the same vein that, let's say we say Jamaican culture. What is Jamaican culture? Jamaican culture is not what Africans were doing before they came to Jamaica. That's what he's saying. You know? And it makes sense. Nigerian culture is not what Africans were doing before Nigeria became a nation. Right? Or before the liberation struggle. Uh, Ameri African American culture is not what we were doing before we came to America. Right? That's what he's saying. And he's saying that if you're an intellectual and you're fighting in the name of a Negro African culture, black culture, you're you're not going to accomplish more than coins and sarcophagi. Now, that is, it's a little demeaning, okay? It's a little demeaning. It has its merits, okay? It has its merits. Uh, it has its merits in the sense of, realistically speaking, even when we talk about Ancobia culture, let's say, right? Even when we talk about Ancobia culture, we have to realize that that will be a culture in and of itself, a present culture, a future culture, a culture to build upon. Right. It will not be ancient Kemet II. It will not be, uh, 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 you know, ancient Nigeria, you know, or ancient Yoruba. It won't be it will. You will have to build something that is different and new. And you can't. And if you focus too much on history and he, he's the point here, if you focus too much on history, you'll see that. Yeah. You know, you're just comparing, you know, sarcophagi, which are the, where you get buried, I guess. Right. And coins. You know, so it's a little demeaning, but you have to understand as well. Um, but I mean, here's the thing. There is more value than that in the past. Right. There is more value than that in the past. Uh, 
it's but the the circumstance of the present is what he's articulating and he's he's correct in that sense you know African American culture is different from Jamaican culture is different from Haitian culture is different from uh uh you know whatever other culture why because they're different pre at present they're different nations uh the different nations and 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 if and if you're just saying hey you know african american culture and jamaican culture and haitian culture are the same because they all come from africa yeah that's that's a good statement but you're ignoring 400 500 years of development or or 200 years or 300 years or 100 years or whatever it could be but you're but 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 not just that you're ignoring the it doesn't matter how many years you're ignoring what we realistically speaking what you're ignoring is the present and that's the problem you know that's a problem uh he says, you know, the culture should be about the liberation struggle. Uh, and that would be, and I think that's more so saying ideally the intellectual would make it about the uh, uh, liberation struggle. But again, that's also ignoring the present. You know, that's one of the things that happened to uh, African Americans in, uh, in, uh, in like the, the general milieu is that African American intellectuals were articulating African American culture as that liberation struggle you know we were the 60s we were the black panthers we were the civil rights movement we were we were a bunch of fighters you know and we're projecting to the world that hey we're this rebellious uh radical uh you know entity and then what happens is that when people meet african americans they're like it's not y'all what's that like that's not you like that's not your present circumstance you know and so, so that in and of itself is another problem. Now, I would agree that it's better to put up that past, but it is kind of like doing the same thing over and over. Like it's, it's kind of doing the same thing you're condemning, uh, uh, you know, people who look further back for. You know, you're saying, let's look back 40 years instead of let's look back 400 years. And I mean, sure, 40 and 400 are, you know, a scale different. But... Uh, but again, that's really what's going on. You know, if you look at the present circumstance, if you say, what is African-American culture? What is so on and so forth? Or if you, uh, let's say, again, African-Americans are not a nation. So that's a little more different for, difficult for the national culture. But if you say, what is Jamaican culture? Like, if you say, what is Jamaican culture? People know. It's that dancing. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, it's that dancing. It's that, or it could be that music, but it, it's some of it. But like, you know, again, culture is a little diverse. So what he's saying is ideally you would put the... Uh, liberation struggle and people like you know the black historians would say ideally you will put the 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 global struggle the global liberation struggle uh realistically speaking by his argumentation you would just put the present circumstance and you would include the dancing you would include the 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 you know the the gang banging you would include all that but uh, that's why i wouldn't even like like i said i don't necessarily agree uh with this I think it's a little demeaning. I think it's a little, like I said, it's a little bit contradictory, but it is what it is, right? Uh, I hope that was uh, a little bit intelligible, right? Uh, Revolutionary Matron says, we were not the same in Africa. We would not be the same outside of Africa. Yeah, a single-minded focus is all we need. Yeah, and, and again, we have this different, like we have this different experience. And not just we have a different experience, but we have to realize that we're just in different places. Like, like, I'll say it this way too. You know, Michigan culture, right, and uh, uh, New York culture are different, right? And even if you go to New York, Brooklyn culture and Queens culture is different. You know, Harlem culture and 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 and, and uh, Bed Stuy culture is different. the The reality is this: that you know, you could always just you know nitpick, nitpick, nitpick. Uh, you could always do that. There's no sense in, I mean, all he's really saying, or all he should be saying is that he thinks that history should be represented in an ideal way, and that ideal way being the revolutionary struggle, right? That's fine, right? But that's not, that doesn't mean you got to downcast people who say, you know what, I think history should be represented in a racial struggle, or, 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 or with racial clarity, or, or us identifying across the race, but that's really all it is, right? Fanon, uh, Kofi says, Fanon likes to talk down on black people. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. And uh, Revolutionary Matron says what I would say, which is, uh, what I was about to say, which is this is the problem of the black intellectual. You know? Like, they're just, like, talking down on black people for no reason. Like, nobody else. By the way, I think next Monday, Monday, I'll probably start off at uh, 3 o'clock. So, I'm, or maybe, three, maybe a little later. But I might be a little bit pushing into the evening.
All right. So I'll just put that on the notes. So make sure you guys subscribe if you're not subscribed because, uh, you know, get the no no bell notification because it's not going to be the usual timing. Um, as well, I'm going to, yeah. And, and, and actually this, this uh, yeah. All right. So there is no common destiny between the national cultures of Guinea and Senegal, but there is a common destiny between the nations of Guinea and Senegal. So look at this. There's no common destiny between the national cultures of Guinea and Senegal, but there's a common destiny between the nations of Guinea and Senegal dominated by the same French colonialism. So, so like what he's saying is this, and that's actually not that bad, but what he's saying is that the national culture of Guinea and the national culture of Senegal do not have a common destiny. OK, uh, the national culture of Jamaica and the national and, 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 and then I have the same. But the nations do have a common destiny, you know, that liberation. Right. Uh, this is a little bit nuanced. Now, this is really only the case if these countries do not unite. You know what I mean? If these countries do not share the same political body and it becomes like Guinea Senegal or something like that, right? Or Guinea Gal, you know? <laughs> or get the gal, you understand? All right. But if you don't have that, right? Uh, if you don't if you don't have that, then sure, you're gonna develop different national cultures. Because again, like I said, like if you're being very literal, Harlem culture is different from Brooklyn culture. Like culture is really a local phenomenon, right? And so if you're, if you're separated by a huge distance, if you're separated by water, if you're separated even by a short distance, you know, you're going to have a different culture. You know, just any grouping, period. And, and really, culture, again, I, I like to go back to, uh, uh, and this is, this is one of the things I really think is really important, to be honest, right? I want to go back to John, Rib no, not John Bruce. Uh, uh, What's his brother's name? Hold on a second. I got this book right here, so I got to just look over my shoulders. Jay Rogers, right? So I want to go back to Jay Rogers, where Jay Rogers, you know, he does that usual, I don't want to say cool and stuff, but the usual cool and stuff, where you, you talk about black people as individuals. We're individuals. We're part of the human race. We're individuals, right? The reality is this, that you are an individual, you know? Uh, like, my parents come from Jamaica, right? But I could kind of pass for African-American, you know? Uh, like, like particularly in, in, in the, in the language I, or even like this, I'll say it this way, you know, one day I'm, uh, I'm minding my business and you know, young boy, Machiavelli, you guys know Machiavelli. Oh, uh, he's on, he's in the chat. You know what? Machiavelli tells me something like that's cap, right? Whatever I'm saying. And I'm just like, what in the world are you saying? Like, what do you mean that's cap? What is that? Capitulate? You know, to this day, I still think he's talking about, I'm like capitulate. What is, who's capitulating? Right. But cap is just American slang, you know? And the point is that you as an individual, me as an individual, right? Notwithstanding the fact that my parents come from Jamaica, it's this interaction with Machiavelli that gets me, I'm saying the cap more often, than, like, I, like much more frequently than I've ever had before, right? But the point being that, you know, you as an individual, you have that. And so now I engage people, right? I engage, you know, other people. And I'm like, oh, that's cap. And that's cap, 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 cap. Right. And that right there is spreading that sort of, uh, you know, you could say slang that I picked up from Machiavelli, that Machiavelli picked up from somebody else and so forth. But the point is that you form a culture based off of individuals interacting with one another and individuals inside of that locality interacting with one another. Right. Or individuals just period right, right with each other. If Guinea and Senegal, for instance, develop a, a nice trading relationship. Right. Where very like very many of them. Uh, are going back and forth, you know, whether, you know, p you know, Guinean uh, uh, medical professionals are working in Senegal or, 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 or Senegalese programmers are working in Guinea. If you have that constant interaction, that interrelation, then that will impact also, you know, that same individual slang, the same as so forth. And you'll see a culture forming from that, you know, just like how we have these memes and these and this LOL and this you know whatever we have all that from this in, engagement with interact with uh with uh the internet notwithstanding what national background we may have you know so 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 to say that you know culture really does come down to individuals and interactions and engagement and 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 and, and that you know and it's it's and and so but here's the here's the here's the nuance okay 
here's what I, how I kind of differentiate between most people in the sense that I do not look at black people on a blank slate. I don't look at, I look at individuals, right? I look at us as individuals, sure. But I also understand that we're individual animals. And I know that as animals, a part of your behaviorisms, a part of your standard of living or your standards or, or just how you, how you exist in this world comes down to, a, 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 a large degree comes down to biology. Okay? A large degree comes down to biology. And that's where Africans and Europeans differ. You know? Uh, I'm not going to say that me and every other African person has identical biology because that would be ridiculous, right? But it's very closely related and very different, I would say, from Wazungu. You know, Wazungu has this lie where they say, you know, uh, like I remember, my, <laughs> I remember my brother saying something stupid like this. Like my brother, because like science can, t science can confuse you. You know, I like science, you know, uh, Machiavelli likes science, obviously, but I like science, right? So I'm not, you know, into this anti-science or nothing like that, right? But I want to tell you this one time, I had this conversation with my brother, it didn't make any damn sense, where he's like, because he, he's convinced with science, he was, he was a science, 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 right? And he's like, you know, like, what, what's with this racial talk and blah, blah, blah? Do you know that there are some, like, that black people are very genetically diverse, they're so diverse that there, in fact, are some black people who are more closely related to white people than other black people, right? And he's like... Uh, and of course, you know, I think that that statistic that white people put out more so has to do with, you know, the fact that we got some mulattos and all that stuff. You know, we got some uh, biracial people uh, in the in the in the in the survey. Uh, uh, and, you know, shout out to uh, Revolution Age and she had a program yesterday where they were. I heard them going in on that, but I couldn't, you know, listen uh, in its entirety. So I got I'm, I'm upset I was going to put it on. A, I got to put it on later. But but. You know, I think that was it. But then I come to my brother, I'm like, and he's like, you know, he's like, you know, black, uh, black people, uh, he's like, yeah, black people are not as closely related to each other. And there are some white people who are uh, more related to black folk than, you know, so on and so forth. And then he goes and says something like, like, even you and me, we could be, like, there could be a white person more related to uh, 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 me than they are, you know, th than you are to me. And I'm like, dude, we're brothers. You know? Like we're, <laughs> like, we're literally like 99.9%, you know what I mean? Like, like, we're like twins, you know? Like, we're just, we're just a bit off twins. But, but because of, you know, uh, uh, the scientific perspective of saying that black people, blah, blah, like, you suddenly just get out of the, the reality that, realistically speaking, you know, your siblings, your brothers and sisters, are the closest things to you genetically, closer than your parents, Right? Uh, because, because your parents are, because basically, you know, if you know about genetics and you know about bio, uh, uh, DNA replication, right, or reproduction, basically your parent gives 50, your other, your other parent gives, uh, 50, and then you're that blend between, uh, uh, the, the, the parts that they gave, right? And, and so y your brothers come from the same damn recipe. Your sisters come from the same damn recipe. You understand? Uh, and so, you know, of course, you know, I thought it was foolish that he would say that, but... But, but like, if you go further, you know, your cousin, your distant cousin, your so on and so forth, they all also have that same damn formula. Just going back, grandparents. That's about it. You know? Uh, you, you know, you would be closely related to uh, people that look like you, more or less. And, and I would also just continue to say that, you know, your behaviorism is uh, fit. Like, it does. Sense that a lion and a wildebeest, you know, could be in the same environment, but you know that biologically speaking, they will behave differently, you know. And and if you go into like dog breeds or whatever, you know, biologically speaking, and the only thing is that we tend to look at it. Uh, white people tend to give it to you like, oh, you know, we're uh, we're uh, you know, you know, we're all humans and we're all blank slate and you know, so on and so forth. But I'm not convinced. You know, I'm not convinced. And, and not just that, you know, white people have admitted that there's this factor in their DNA of of the uh, Neanderthal. Uh, and I'm not going to say that, you know, there's no black person with the Neanderthal DNA because, you know, there was this rape going on. Right. Uh, obviously, they say in Africa, it's it's like there was none. But, you know, outside of Africa, sure. Right. Uh, that being said, you know, that Neanderthal gene. Right. 
that's going to have an impact. You understand? It cannot not have an impact. Right. And, 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 and that right there is uh, where it would differentiate, because if you look at European cultures, right, I mean, I, like I said, I go back to like once upon a time, I used to study European philosophy. Right. And one of the best ones to study would be Plato. Right. Plato would point out that, you know, societies are based off of, you know, humans, you know, like like just based off of uh, how the human himself organized, like how the human himself is organized. He would make societies that are akin to how he himself is organized right and the reality is that when you look at european civilizations in the past and you look at african civilizations in the past there is a fundamental difference you know check on the joke calls it the uh, another misogynist by the way <laughs> but check on the joke calls it the north cradle the northern cradle and the southern cradle and he differentiates the southern cradle as more uh xenophilic you know loving of humans uh he you know as as more having a having more abundance have more so on and so forth and he differentiates that with the uh, with wazungu who are have a destroy like who have a xenophobia who have uh who like tragedy more than comedy who like so on and so forth and you know he likens it to the environment he says oh well you know if you're in the ice age you know if you're in the ice and you have limited food versus if you're in the sun and you have plenty of food you know that's going to have an impact uh and sure it possibly but over time it does also contribute like there are ways to observe black people and white people, even in reverse context, and black folks still doing what black folk do at home. You know what I mean? And white folks still doing what white folk do at home. And that's, that's, that's what it is. Um, but anyway, so yeah, uh, I just want to say about that, about the culture. So if you want the, uh, actually, let me see if there's any comments. Uh, Old head. <laughs> I'm trying to call me an old head, and he said cap. Yeah, cap. I, I never used them before. All right, so uh, Revolutionary Major says, as she corrects it later, as black people, we a family. They use science, religion, social controls, political antics, and several techniques to make us think that we are different. We aren't. Yeah, I should tell you guys about my brother. So my brother, he messed with a white woman. Like he messed with two white women. Uh, 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 like like long term. Like like one of them he married. You know what I'm saying? And then she was just not appealing, like not, you know, neither of them were appealing, but like the other one's just like, ugh, right? But either way, you know, uh, like, yeah, that's what you expect, you know? That's what you expect when you, when you're engaged so deeply in Wazungu's propaganda, right? You, 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 you're, you're manipulated into a cracker lover, okay? Uh, you're manipulated into it, and that's, that's. That's why, you know, like I said, like there's some quotes uh, John Ray Bruce gave. Uh, and he was like, uh, one of them I liked, I recorded a long time ago, which was, uh, our environment makes us think white so consistently that some of us do not have time to think black. You know? Like, because I'm telling you, I'm telling you, this dude's looking at me, telling me that we, like there might be a white person more related to him than I am. And it's just like, you got to be an idiot. Like, 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 I understand science. I understand what the science is telling you that there, there could be a white person more related to black people than there are, uh, than black people are related to another black person. True. But, I mean, not true, but, you know, that's, the, that's, that's what they're telling you, right? But even if you believe that, you can't look at your brother, right? And, and tell him that's the like, that, that applies to you too. But it kind of tells you where his allegiance will be. If he thinks somehow there's some white person who's more genetically related to him than his own brother. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, but that that's like, like you know, sometimes uh, I think it was Maya Angelou who said when somebody tells when somebody tells you who they are, believe them the first time. You know, my issue is that I didn't believe them the first time, you know. Uh, so, you know, eventually I come into some uh, we come to some economic squabble, not economic squabble, but we have some economic disagreement. And I realize how much I have empowered him to do whatever he needs to do. You know what I mean? Like, I, I, I would trust him like a brother because he was a brother. But, uh, fit, but biologically. You understand? But, but mentally, you know, spiritually, you know, uh, and, and that's that's really what you have to like. That's, a, that's another thing you got to understand as people. You know, sometimes you got to look at people not just on their physicality, not just on their biology. You got to know what their mentality is at, where, they, where, where their mentals are. 
you know? Um, if you want a national culture of Senegal to resemble the national culture of Guinea, it is not enough for the leaders of the two countries to address the problems of independence, labor unions, and the economy from a similar perspective. Even then, they would not be absolutely identical since the people and the leaders operate at a different pace. Yes. There can be no such thing as rigorously identical cultures. To believe one can create a black culture is to forget oddly enough that Negroes are in the process of disappearing since those who created them are witnessing the demise of their economic and cultural supremacy. So that's actually pretty interesting. Let's see what the footnote says. At the last school prize giving ceremony in Dakar, the president of the Republic of Senegal, Leopold Senghor, uh, I think he was a writer too, announced that negritude should be included in the school curriculum. If this decision is an exercise in cultural history, it can only be approved. But if it is a matter of shaping black consciousness, it's simply turning one's back on history, which has already noted that fact that most Negroes have ceased to exist. So I don't know what he's, I mean, I think he's trying to say something poetic. I don't know what he's trying to say, to be honest. Um, uh, says so Negroes are in the process of disappearing. So I, I guess, so here's the thing. So here's the thing we have to realize. Again, white boy comes to Africa and creates Africans in a sense, you know, uh, in the sense of, I mean, that's, what, that's, that's one of the things I want people, I mean, people really should understand it. That's one of the things that I think is really complicated. That's why I use the word Oncovia sometimes, you know, you're not going to have, like, because Africa's not a country. You get what I'm saying? Like, like, like right now, this white boy in America calls himself an American. Okay, sometimes he might call himself a European American, but for the most part, he calls himself American because America is the country he's in. You know, maybe sometimes he might even say he's a New Yorker or something. But but the reality is that he calls himself an American and he would not call himself a European per se. He is a European racially, of course, uh, but he's going to call himself an American because that's the country he's in. Or that's the that's the nationality he has. The same as because right now what 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 Fanon is focusing on is nationality, okay? Uh, and so what that means is that there's no Negro nationality. You understand? There's a Negro sub nationality, but there's no Negro nationality. And and as soon as you're no longer the sub nationality, you're now a Ghanaian. You're now a Senegalese. You're now Nigerian. And that's so if you're now teaching you know, Negro or negritude or, 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 or African or whatever, right? Uh, as a, as like, as like, this is who you are. You're an African. You're not so on and so forth. It sounds good. It sounds good. What he's saying is that really you would want to teach, like really, if you're like, like, like what United States does, it teaches that you're an American. It teaches about Europe, but it teaches that you're an American, you know? Uh, in UK, they teach you about Europe, they teach you about America, but they teach you about, that they teach you that you're a British person, you know, a British man or a British woman or whatever, right? In France, they tell you you're a Frenchman or French woman, they do not tell you that you're a European, per se, you know? Uh, I, I'm not going to say that's a good idea or a bad idea. I think it is good to teach your people that they're African or teach people about Africa. Definitely teach people about their Africa. But that's why I even promote the Oncobia thing because I'm saying to myself, yeah, you want people to say I'm an Oncobian, right? Uh, or I'm a, I'm Oncobio or whatever, right? Uh, you don't want them. I mean, you you want them to say that. You want them to you want them to rec identify with a nation uh, fundamentally because at the end of the day. Yeah, at the end of the day, it's it's like if you're running a nation, this is the thing. If you're running a nation, you want your people to have uh, solidarity and, and, and union with the decisions of your nation. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you don't want them deciding with other nations. You know, if you're if you're a French man, you don't want people siding with your uh, England or you don't want when come when come time to fight Germany. You say, why would I fight my own people? You get what I'm saying? Like you don't, you don't want that. Uh, just, just, just. That's just I'm saying this strategy. Uh, and I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, damn, this podcast good. Why nobody listen to it? Cause y'all not sharing it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> nah, I just wasn't. Uh, Kofi says he was giving you signs from early. Uh, oh, my brother. Yeah, my brother was giving me signs from early, definitely. Uh, and I'm telling you, like, like again, you just, you just, it's hard with your family. You know, it's hard with your family. I understand that, you know, because because with my family, I kind of like pushed them all away. But I kept my brothers, you know, 
Because, you know, so far they had never done me wrong. Now, this guy was messing with white women, but, you know, it was, it was him messing with white women. You know what I'm saying? Like, I was, you know, like, I was like, yeah, I don't like these white women. I'm not going to hang out with these white women, but that's still my brother. And my brother was, uh, was, was, was pushing me on that same way. She's like, that's your brother, you know? Like, I remember one time, I don't remember saying this. I think my mother, I don't think I remember saying it to him. I think my mother might have told on him. But he was inviting me to this wedding with this white girl. And I was like, I ain't, and then apparently until he tells me, some, you know, when he's, when we're finally, you know, face, you know, arguing or whatever. He's like, you turn, you're not going to come to my wedding because I'm marrying a white woman. You're not going to a white woman's wedding. I'm like, yeah, you're going to a white woman's wedding. Like, what? <laughs> well, I don't even tell him that. But, uh, but yeah, you know what I mean? Like, you know, uh, they're like, you know, like, like, I remember my mother was on my ass about that. But she was like, that's your brother and blah, blah, blah. And even my, even my friend was like, that's my brother. But of course, that friend goes and marries a white woman too. Invited me to his wedding. Yeah, okay, bro. Uh, if I'm not going to my brother's wedding, you know what I'm saying? But anyway, uh, there'll be no such thing as black culture because no politi politician imagines his vocation to create a black republic, right? The problem is knowing what role these men have in store for their people, the type of social relations they will establish in their idea of the future of humanity. That is what matters. All else is high air and mystification. So again, yeah, so, so actually he, this is a point right here. This is the point right here. He's like, look, there's not going to be a black culture because there's no politician that's going to make a black republic. You understand? And even this, like, when they do make a black republic, listen to this. Haiti is considered the black republic. Free black people, free black republics, so on and so forth. You know, this is a land for black liberation, so on and so forth. But you call it Haiti. You understand? And so the people there call themselves Haitians. Or Aysian. Aysian. Right? That's what, it, that's what it's really about. It's a really about, when you talk about nationalism and nation building, you're really talking about establishing a new national identity. You, uh, one of the issues that we have as a people is that we think establishing a new national identity means, you know, just promoting Africa, right? And that's just not, an, it's not, it's really not enough, you know, low key. Uh, of course, if you want to read more about that, you know, you know where to go. You know, I got my books. Uh, you know, I got the book of power. So uh, Mchaka says, it be your own people sometimes. Definitely destroying their own bloodline and issue. Yeah. Well, I mean, as far as I know, they don't have no kids right now, which is good. Uh, but yeah, it's, but like, well, like, like, honestly, my bloodline is almost over. You know what I mean? Uh, like my, like the, 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 as much as my ancestors have thrived and survived, it's like, yeah, uh, I, I probably have, uh, like my bloodline is probably over. Uh, but with the exception of my son, uh, uh, it's like, like, like none of my siblings, uh, have kids. And that's, that's the thing. A lot of people, a lot of African people. Uh, who are a little bit better off, a little well-to-do, are not having kids, you know, uh, for, for better or worse. Uh, you know, basically, it's the same circumstance. Because a lot of people that do, ha like, a lot of people that are having kids, you know, they're, they're like, a part of that, that class that's always been down. You know what I mean? But, like, at least they have fun, you know, have sex, have a kid, you know, have an abortion, don't have an abortion, you know, fall in love, good life. But... Uh, but yeah, their, their lines are going to continue. You know what I mean? Um, uh, like I said, uh, like, like my ex-wife's sister probably has like five kids or something with like four different baby daddies or something like that. You know what I mean? Uh, uh, and, and she, she like, their kids are like wild and you know, all that kind of stuff. But you know, whereas me, I got like, you know, you know, my ex-wife, we have one, you know, and that's it. Uh, so yeah, that's the, uh, like that's the reality of, uh, the situation. Cause you hear a lot of, uh, older black women or older black men, you know, who say, yeah, I don't have any kids, you know? And they and they, they seem like good people, obviously, but you know, that says a lot, you know, it says a lot. Um, anyway, in 1959, the African intellectuals meeting in Rome constantly spoke of unity. Uh, oh, actually though, look, look, so before, I guess in case anybody gets too depressed, you know, some of y'all could like freeze your eggs or, or, uh, or your sperm or something. You know, uh, this guy's quoting the Bible to me: "Be fruitful and multiply only." And meanwhile, this guy ain't got no kids. Anyway, <laughs> not on the continent. All my uncles and aunts have at least four kids each. It seems. Well, I mean, in one marriage, not multiple people. Yeah, 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 yeah. But that's what I'm saying. Like, that's a different generation. You know, like, like, like my parents come from, like, my grandmother had like twelve kids. You get what I'm saying? Uh, uh, so it's not like, and my mother had like, uh, four kids or something, you know? Uh, 
So it's not like 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 that's the thing with modern society, modern Western societies is that they kind of low key discourage you from reproducing. You know, uh, if people remember this whole you know uh, you know depopulation scheme and this whole uh, uh, Bill Gates thing, uh, that's what it was about. It was about getting people to have less kids. You know what I mean? Uh, I'm talking to say he's still a kid. Dude, you get you pushing, you pushing, you you no longer a kid, man. Anyway, but but <laughs> he like in his twenties, like like there are people in their twenties with a bunch of kids. Like, you know, uh but but yeah, I mean like yeah, like like of course, you know, some people do have kids, some people do get kids, but uh, you know, like one of the issues, one of the impediments is getting a working relationship. You know? Uh, I would have had four kids if I had my relationship working out, but you know, that was my plan. But because the relationship wasn't working out, I wasn't finna bring four kids into it. You know, then it make no sense. Uh, but anyway, uh, in 1959, the African intellectuals meeting in Rome constantly spoke of unity. But one of the leading bards of this cultural unity is Jacques Rabamanjara, today a minister in the government of Madagascar, who towed his government's line to vote against the Algerian people at the United Nations General Assembly. Uh... Okay, I don't know why he's voting against them, but uh, Rabe, if he had been sincere with himself, should have resigned from the government and denounced those men who claim to represent the will of the Mal Malagasy people. The 90,000 dead of Madagascar did not authorize Rabe to oppose the aspirations of the Algerian people at the UN General Assembly. Negro African cultures grows deeper through the people's struggle and not through songs, poems, or folklore. Sangor, who is also a member of the African Society for Culture and who has worked with us on this issue of African culture, had no scruples either about instructing his delegation to back the French line on Algeria. Support for Negro African culture and the cultural unity of Africa is first contingent on an unconditional support for the people's liberation struggle. One cannot expect African culture to advance unless one contributes realistically to the creation of the conditions necessary for this culture, i.e. the liberation of the continent. So what he's saying is this, that you could talk all this Negro African culture and then still vote against, uh, like vote along with the imperialist France against Algeria. Now, here's Fanon's weird thinking in the sense that Negro African is not Algeria. You understand? Algeria is 99% uh, Arab. Arab or Berber. It's not Negro African at all. So... It, it behooves you to use that as the litmus test. Now, I'm not going to say that you should vote along with the French against the Arabs, but I also, but I also could understand if you do. It's like, it's like when America is going against Afghanistan. I'm, I know I keep bringing it up. But when America, like, like you don't have a, a dog in a fight. You know, and if somebody were to say, you're not about Negro African culture because you are supporting, you know, because you like the United States or because you like, uh, like, that don't make no sense. Like, it got nothing to do with anything. You know, so, 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 you know, real talk, Fanon could miss me on that. Uh, but, 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 you know, it is what it is. You know, like I said, you know, when you know somebody's uh, sexual history, you kind of know a lot about them. He says, uh, oh, I'm still a kid, though. No, he says, damn, a whole clan of onies? Yikes, yeah. Well, well, good for you. It's not going to happen. Well, probably not. Well, probably won't happen. All right. So, Revolutionary says, Les, yes, you are, Mchaka. Also, an impediment to even freezing eggs is economics. The procedure is not cheap. Also, surrogacy is expensive. Like, very expensive. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so Revolutionary Mention is saying that there are impediments towards... Uh, so I was just trying not to be a damper, a damper Dan, you know? Uh, or whatever it is. <laughs> I was just trying not to be uh, too depressing. But, uh, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, there's, like, like, unfortunately, like, a lot of people who do have kids have them unintentionally. Uh, people who do have them intentionally tend to have them a little later, you know, tend to limit their numbers, you know, uh, like, like, like Umchaka and Debbie Downer. Yeah. Well, no, nah, but you got to have a guy. Debbie is like a woman. Right. But Umchaka saying, you know, like he's still young. He's kind of old for having a kid. Because like, like, here's the thing. People were having people would have kids at 14 or 16. You know what I'm saying? Uh, it's not advised in the West. You know? Like, in the West, it's advised to finish your education. In the West, it's advised to get yourself a career. It's advised to... You don't do that at 14 or 16. <laughs> well, not in, not in modern Western culture, you know? Uh, you, you have that in 
uh, in like cultures where you don't go to get advanced degrees. Uh, and then not just that, you have to date somebody to date them for a couple of years. You have to know what it's like to live with them. You have to experience uh, life with them. You have to know, like, like, you know, you have to say to yourself, is this somebody I want to live with for, you know, this long? Is this somebody I want to engage with for this long? You know, like, even with me, like, I, even, I only have one kid. But, like, I got to engage his mother for, like, another 15 years. You know, and usually, you know, you, you're doing it to someone I used to know. You know what I mean? Like, you, you, engage, in a sister, you engage in a sister and you're like, okay, I, I knew that woman once upon a time. Right? Now you got to, like, you know, regularly communicate with somebody who you ain't like communicating with anymore, you know? Uh, but it's, it's around a child, obviously. But, but that's like, that's what's going on. And, and then for most people, you know, again, like I said, it's a price. If, if your relationship doesn't work with a woman, right, you could end up paying child support, you know, for years or end up going to prison over it, you know? Uh, and again, you know, you want a woman that's correct, that, can't, like, that, that, that doesn't sabotage you. You know, and then not just that, when a woman has a child, she's going to behave differently. She's going to act differently. Her priorities change. Her, 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 uh, her, her, her ambitions shift. You know, sometimes she's, she's of the opinion that she doesn't want to. Well, sometimes she's of the opinion that she wants to go and work. She's going to change that, possibly. Sometimes she's of the opinion she don't want to work. She's going to change that, possibly. You know, uh, sometimes she's of the opinion she likes to travel. She's going to change that, possibly. Sometimes she's of the opinion she don't want to travel. She's going to change that, possibly. Like, like, and the thing is that you are going to change and evolve as well. You know, I, I'm talking to men, obviously. But, you know, everyone changes and evolves. So you're going you're gonna to come across, like, it's, it's really complicated in the West. In Africa, right, or in the, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in the village, if you will, right? You know, what Machado is probably talking about. Like, your life is pretty static, you know? Uh, and not just that, you know, your community's helping you out with your children. You know, you could have a child and it's just going to be, it, you know, the child is going to be one of many walking around and running around and coming back to get some food and then going back to play. And they're safe and they're secure and they, there's like a whole infrastructure already set up for them. Right. In the, in the, in the West, you don't have that. You know, your child is going to be in your home and the infrastructure set up is by your enemy. And your enemy is going to give you a bunch of propaganda. And you, and look, like I said, if you're a conscious black person, you're going to not want that propaganda. Right? But that already limits your dating pool. You understand? Because, see, cause see, at least for me, I could have went to this lady that I, I, I married and I'd be like, yeah, I don't want my kid going to the public school system. And, of course, you know, there's a pushback for that, too. Uh, there's a pushback for that. Because I can have people change their opinions, you know? But, uh, you know, you're like, I don't want this lady. But you could go to some other lady. And be like, I don't want my food to, uh, I don't want my kid to have go to the public food system. And she says, I don't want you to have custody of my kid. I don't do whatever the fuck I want. Like, like pit, like I'm sorry, I don't mean curse, but that's what's gonna happen. So you already gotta watch where you plant your seed. You understand? Uh, there, there's there's a there's a there's a lot to it. It's not it's not gonna be that oh I'm conscious, you conscious, let's have a kid. Cause what does conscious mean? You know. What does conscious mean in America? Like, like you already know. What does conscious mean in America? So, because right now, what it means is nothing. Because see, like, like for instance, like I said, like you read Fanon. One thing I give Fanon props for is that he's talking about arm struggle. You know, you know. Oh, like, like I'll say this right. Matter of fact, I say I'm looking at my son. I'm like, man, this guy's gonna make a good soldier. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But, but his mother's like, no, my son's not gonna. You know, like, but that's what you hear. Like, like, like. You got to realize that you have to be on the same page. And if you're not on the same page, it's going to come up. Everything that you, every little feud, every little conflict, and it, and it comes down to the fact that we have different pasts, different histories, different stories, different ways of development, different cultures. Come back to the reading. We have different cultures. And that's going to impact something in the future. You know? Uh, Revolutionary Major says, you know the struggle. And a conscious in America means to be constant stage of rage. Yeah, you, you look, that, that's what it means to James Baldwin. You understand? That's not what it means to Polite. You see what I'm saying? That's not what it means to Sarah Suit and Seti. That's not what it means to Sister Soldier. That's not what it means to Claude Anderson. You know, all of them have a different meaning, a different definition, a different culture. 
And the thing is that when you, if you engage, you like, hey, you conscious and you coming at it from a James Baldwin perspective, let's say. Let's just simplify it. Come from a James Baldwin perspective. And the other person's coming at it from a, 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 a polite perspective, right? That's going to fail. You got to go deep. You got to really, and, and the thing is, sometimes you're going to talk to somebody and you're going to really connect. You're going to really like them. You're going to really adore them. And you know it's not going to work. You know what I mean? But you, but you, don't, you, don't, have, you don't have it in you. Like, like it's, it's a lot. There, there's a lot going on. And so, you know, definitely, yeah, it's, it's complicated. Like, because like, cause it's a lot for you. Now, if you don't have that conscious, you say, hey, that's a pretty woman. Ah, oh, shoot, I can go to bed with her. All right, you know, you pump, pump, whatever. She likes this, she, I like that. Whoops, we have an accident. Let's raise a kid together. Oh, uh, it didn't work out. I'll pay child support. Or I'll not pay child support. But whatever. You had a kid. Not a conscious person who was like, hey, you know what? I don't know. I don't think it's going to work. I'm trying to raise a kid to be this way, and you're trying to raise a kid to be that way. I don't think it's going to work. Ten years later, they don't got no kids. Who multiplied? That's mathematics. You know? It, 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 it's kind of like the paralysis of analysis, but... It, it it still makes a little bit of sense, you know. Uh, it still makes a little bit of sense, but you know that's that's just the real world. That's just the real world, you know. And so a lot of a lot of black folk come from like a lot of us who were born. I mean, a lot of us who survived came from broken families or came from broken parents, you know. Not to say all of us, uh, depending. And again, like again, like if you come from another uh, country, you know, you might have been in a country that could have supported children. Or you might come from a, a culture that could have supported children, but that culture is fading too. Or, or the, basically, the me metropolitan area, the, the metropolis, is not going to be conducive to those healthy relationships that you see in the village. You know, those, those, the village life, which survived for, uh, you know, uh, 5,000, no, 10, yeah, 5,000 years, is going to produce, you know, parents who could, who could, who could you know, continue. They, they, but then you have the metropolis, which survives 100 years. You know? You have the, the metropolis, the cities that are short-lived, that are constantly collapsing. And those people are forming relationships that are also short-lived and constantly collapsing. You know, it, 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 again, I, I think I put it in the Discord. So make sure you all follow the Discord. You can click the link in the description, right? But... The 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 you're formed you're you're formed by the political economic situation of you the political economy that you're in, you know what I mean? Like that's part of your formation. You know you're not gonna like the the hunter gatherer, right? You know I I put up a video inside the Discord of the hunter gatherer. The hunter gatherer is going to have a different type of relationship from what you have. Okay, the hunter gatherer. Goes out and hunts maybe like three days a, a week or something. I mean, I don't know. I'm just making it up. Comes back and he meets this woman and he brings her some meat. And he, and he goes back into his hut and she comes into the hut and they have sex. You know? There's no bills being paid. There's no economic disputes. There's no, you know what I mean? There's no what you're going to do with your life. All he's going to do with his life is get up, go out hunting, come back, bring some food. Right? He's... His relationship could work, you know, and it might be that. And here's the thing, too. It might be that he go out and or even him and his friend, you know, sit and take turns on the same lady, you know, and they don't have any qualm about it because they're like, we're just having sex. We don't care. Now, me, if, if somebody sharing a woman with me, like, well, hold on a second. Let me let me get out of here. You know, it's your political economy that shapes you. You, you got to understand that. So, so yeah, I mean, just, I'm just saying that, you know, just to clarify, when, 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 when we talk about how our parents had, uh, you, know, you, know, you know, had our own sort of thing. Like, they're a different generation, different political economy. You know? Like, that village life is not hard. That village life, you ain't got no real bills. You know, you just get up, you know, do your little farming, come home, and, you know, you're working together to build something. In, 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 the, in the modern society, you working by yourself... And then you come back to a house with somebody else who's working by themselves with with issues and bills. 
and 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 geopolitical news and opportunities abroad and opportunities to travel and you know it's not the same as just living in the same village you know with a bunch of kids running around outside uh, but anyway uh and I, I don't know if you know like like i'm not saying them chaka's family is just a bunch of villages I, I don't know uh it could be that they you know in the metropolitan area themselves but again you know everything is just different you know you can't it's it's like in fact we're just talking about it. you can't compare cultures because we're just in a different place. Uh, once again, though, no speech, no declaration on culture will detract us from our fundamental tasks, which are to liberate the national territory, constantly combat the new forms of colonialism, and as leaders, stubbornly refuse to indulge in self-satisfaction at the top. So uh, this is what he's saying. He, like his, his main focus, and this is a good focus, by the way, is to liberate the national territory, liberate the nations, combat colonialism as we see it, and for leaders to not be greedy. Don't indulge and self-satisfaction at the top. So mutual foundations for national struggle and liberation struggles. The sweeping, leveling nature of colonial domination was quick to dislocate in a particular fashion the cultural life of a conquered people. The denial of a national reality, the new legal system imposed by the occupying power, the marginalization of the indigenous population and their customs by colonial society expropriation and the systematic, systemi systematic uh, enslavement of men and women all contributed to the cultural obliteration. Wait, hold on a second. Uh, the sweeping, leveling nature of clone. I was just thinking to myself, that was a good ass thing. And I'm like, why am I not sharing this? Right? Or why are nobody watching this? All right, well, you guys are watching it though. So appreciate everybody. How, do I, how many? I said three concurrent viewers. Yeah, see, I, I, I like I'm Chaco. I mean, I, like a uh, bit of medicine points out, you got more than three people in the chat. I mean, I guess you only have four, real talk. Let me see. One, two, three, four. Yeah. So, I mean, it, I'm wondering, like, like it says three concurrent viewers, it, it peaks at four. So maybe that's what it is. Uh, but, you know, y'all let me know if there's uh, more people, uh, if, 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 if YouTube is just lying about the numbers or if it really. But, I mean, it's all good. Uh, I appreciate everybody for coming through. Because I think this is good. And if you think it's good, then I'm going to keep doing it, right? All right. So the, the sweeping. And I'd still do it if you didn't think it was good. Because, you know, you just got to do what you want to do sometimes. All right. So the sweeping, leveling nature of colonial domination was quick to dislocate in spectacular fashion, the cultural life of a conquered people. The denial of national reality, the new legal system imposed by the occupying power, the marginalization of the indigenous population and their custom by colonial uh, society exploitation and the systematic enslavement of men and women all contribute to the cultural liberation. So he's talking about how uh, the, co the, co the colonizer do, uh, obliterated the black culture, uh, the, the local culture. So he says, three years ago at our first Congress, I demonstrated that in a colonial situation, any dynamicism is fairly rapidly replaced by a reification of attitudes. The cultured sphere is marked out by safety railings and signposts, every single one of them defense mechanisms of the most elementary type, comparable in more ways than one of the simple instinct of self-preservation. This period is interesting because the oppressor is no longer content with the objective non-existence of the conquered nation and culture. Every effort is made to make the colonized confess the inferiority of their culture, now reduced to a set of instinctive responses, to acknowledge the unreality of their nation, and in the last extreme, to admit the disorganized, half-finished nature of their own biological makeup. Uh, again, it's just a bunch of talk. Let's just keep going. The reactions of the colonized to the situation vary. Whereas the masses maintain intact traditions totally incongruous with the colonial situation, whereas the style of artisanship ossifies into an increasingly stereotyped formalism, the intellectual hurls himself frantically into the frenzied acquisition of the occupier's culture, making sure he denigrates his national culture, or else confines himself to making a detailed, methodical, zealous, and rapidly sterile inventory of it. Okay, what both reactions have in common is that they both result in unacceptable contradictions. Renegade or substantialist, the colonized subject is ineffectual precisely because the colonial situation has not been rigorously analyzed. The colonial situation brings national culture virtually to a halt. There is no such thing as national culture, national cultural events, uh, innovations, or reform within the context of colonial domination, and there never will be. There are scattered instances of bold attempts to revive a cultural dynamicism, reshape themes, forms, and tones, the immediate tangible and visible effects of this minor convulsion is nil. But if we focus the consequence of this very limit, there are signs that the veil is being lifted from the national consciousness, oppression is being challenged, and there's hope for the liberation struggle. So uh, I'll just try to, you know, take a, take a jab at it. Again, these are like one of those, this is one of those wordy, 
like hyper intellectual things that really turn people off from reading. Um, I could say this. Um, he's saying that there's no national, like basically he's just reemphasizing that point of, of liberation is the basis of national culture. And, and of course it contradicts his older thing of the present circumstance, but again, his present circumstance might have been a uh, uh, liberation phase, right? Uh, notwithstanding that, uh, you know, now that we're the post-liberation, you know, 60 years later, uh, we can't necessarily say that liberation is the matter of culture uh, as much as, you know, the present, case, present circumstance. Uh, be that as it may, uh, he's saying that under colonialism, you do not have a national culture. You don't have national cultural events. You have, uh, like, you just have the domination. Uh, and that's fair. But again, if, the, if you take that definition, then the African-Americans would not have a culture, right? But that's, that's bizarre and beyond. And that's not what somebody would say. Uh, because, you know, clearly African-Americans have a culture. Uh, like, everybody, like I said, culture is more of an individual engagement that you have individuals. Uh, therefore, you will have a culture. Uh, and especially if individuals are engaging one another and interacting with one another in a great density and a great uh, frequency, you will have a culture that's created through that. Uh, just the same, like I said, Harlem has a culture uh, that's different from uh, um, Atlanta, you know? Like, like it's just a different vibe, a different feel. I think fundamentally, you know, we're all African people, so we're Africans within every context. But, you know, generally speaking, it will just be a different vibe all the time uh and so i mean i get what he's trying to say but again it's it's one of those pontificating leftist you know kind of tongue twist in order that you could feel like you're saying something when it's not really what's going on right uh so you just kind of just read read past it so national culture under colonial domination is a culture under interrogation whose destruction is sought systematically very quickly it becomes a culture condemned to clandestinity this notion of clandestinity which clandestine basically means like secretive can immediately be perceived in the re reactions of the occupier who interprets this complacent attachment all right so again they do the same replace you know same pages over and over again which is fine so we just continue complacent attachment uh to traditions as a sign of loyalty to the national spirit and refusal to submit this uh Persistence of cultural expression condemned by colonial society is already a demonstration of nationhood. But so basically, his whole thing, I just wanted to just clarify, his whole thing is that your culture is just you fighting the other people. You know what I mean? Like, because the colonizer is reacting to you, therefore you have a nationhood. You have a culture. You're doing a cultural expression. Now, that's one of the issues that black people, like, I, sorry, that like nationalists have with the socialists, you know, in the sense that. They do not want to define you outside of your engagement with Wazungu. You know? They don't want to define what you are outside of Wazungu. So for him, the fact that the colonial society is, is, is like you have a cultural expression that's condemned by the colonial society, right? That, may, that legitimizes your expression. You know? And, and so if you weren't condemned, then it's like that's not even, that's not even culture. That's nothing. You know, all that's culture is you fighting this Wazungu, which is good, you know, in a war sense. It's good in a war, but like war, there's war and there's peace, you know. It's like, uh, I told you guys about this uh, scholar named uh, Adi Rafa. He talks about it's revolution and resolution, you know, uh, as to say what is happening after the revolution, you know. And the thing with socialists that we really have to concede is that they don't really have a, a great conception of that. And, and this kind of conception that he's pointing out would be very limited and, and would probably be discarded by the people, you know, because because suddenly you're like, there's no culture. And all you got to do is, you know, all you got to do is fight these capitalists and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And it's like real talk. I have traditions that I want to exercise, you know, or even worse. You know, you have. Like I said, you're going to have this huge Christian presence and that huge Christian presence can be corrupted because you don't form a culture that doesn't uh, entertain corruption, you know? Uh, they say that Nyerere was probably the best uh, of the Afri Africa's revolutionary leaders to, uh, like, to stamp out tribalism, right? In the sense that people in Tanzania today look at themselves as Tanzanians, first and foremost, 
Like in other countries, they look at themselves as whatever the country is, but they also fundamentally hold on to their uh, former tribal or their former tribes, right? Their, their pre-colonial status. Uh, but it, with, in Tanzania, it was different. It was like, hey, you know what? Let's work together as Tanzanians, you know? Uh, and that's, that's, uh, that's actually something really remarkable. Um, let's see. No offensive has been launched. But again, that's, that's just him. It's not really a, a, a normal thing for uh, other African leaders. Uh, no offensive has been launched. No relations redefined. This is merely a desperate clinging to nucleus that is increasingly shriveled, increasingly inert, and increasingly hollow. After one or two centuries of exploitation, the national cultural landscape has radically shriveled. It has become an inventory of behavioral patterns, traditional costumes, and miscellaneous customs. Little movement can be seen. There is no real creative, no ebullience. Poverty, national oppression, and cultural oppression are one and the same. After a century of colonial domination, culture became a rigid in the extreme, congealed and petrified. The, atro the atrophy of national reality and the death throes of national culture feed on one another. This is why it becomes vital to monitor the development of this relationship during the liberation struggle. Cultural denial, the contempt for any national demonstration or e of emotion or dynamicism, and the banning of any type of organization help spur aggressive behavior in the country. But this... But this pattern of behavior is a defensive reaction, nonspecific, anarchic, and ineffective. Colonial exploitation, poverty, and endemic famine increasingly force the colonized into open, organized uh, rebellion. Gradually, imperceptibly, the need for a decisive confrontation imposes itself and is eventually felt by the great majority of the people. Tensions emerge where pre previously there was none. Intentional international events, the collapse of whole sections of colonial empires, and the inherent contradiction of the colonial system stimulate and strengthen combativity and motivating, motivating and invigorating the national consciousness. These new tensions, which are present at every level of the colonial system, have repercussions on the cultural front. In literature, for example, there is a relative overproduction. Once a pale imitation of the colonizer's literature, indigenous production now shows greater diversity and a will to particularize. Mainly consumer during the period of oppression, the intelligentsia turns productive. This literature is at first confined to the genre of poetry and tragedy. Then novels, short stories, and essays are tackled. There seems to be a kind of internal organization, a law of expression, according to which poetic creativity fades as the objectives and methods of the liberation struggle become clearer. This is a fundamental change of theme. In fact, less and less do we find those bitter, desperate recriminations, those loud, violent outbursts that, after all, reassure the occupier. In the previous period, the colonists encouraged such endeavors and facilitated their publication. The occupier, in fact, likened these scathing denunciations, uh, outpourings of misery, and heated words to an act of catharsis. Encouraging these acts would, in a certain way, avoid dramatization and clear the atmosphere. So this is actually pretty interesting. He's saying that uh, after uh, liberation, right, uh, black folk get rid of the poetry and tragedy, and they start doing novels, short stories, essays, so on and so forth. And of course, this kind of touches on the whole idea of your culture being present. Because one thing is for sure is that uh, a lot of African people were not making novels. I want to say per se. I mean, obviously, there were some empires that probably were. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, like I said, you go to the village life. The villagers are not making novels, right? Maybe short stories, uh, but not necessarily novels, right? Uh, if we know what a novel is, right? Uh, it's, it's very particular to Wazungu's uh, culture. Uh, either way, well, the reason why I point that out is to say that uh, it, you know, I don't know, the reason why I think this is interesting is because he's saying that Wazungu would have liked, like, likes that poetry, likes that tragedy, you know? He likes it. He's like, oh, yeah, these, 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 you know, I support that. And it's actually pretty interesting when you think about it. Because at first, you, you know, at first I was like, that's kind of ridiculous. But as I say it out loud, I'm saying to myself, you know, why people do like hip hop? You know, like white folk do like hip hop. That's that tragedy. That's that poetry. That's that tragic poetry. Real talk. You know, I think I think it was uh, maybe yesterday or two days ago. Mchaka said that rap was. Uh, 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 wait, hold on a second. I'm just looking at the. <laughs> Uh, oh, hold on a second. I think I skipped on some comments. Revolutionary Agent says, as older people, we have to adopt the children that are unwanted. Yeah. And I'm talking says, you can't bear to deal with her sometimes. All right. I don't know. He said bear. And, uh, all right. Revolutionary Agent says, colonial goals 
make you forget make you forget and despise everything that you are or will be yeah yeah but again like also with that it's like you have the poetry that's tragic you know the tragedy and so on and so forth and why people like that like they like hip hop you know they like hip hop they they, they want to hear you talking about Oh, like, for instance, or, or even not just, this is not even tragedy, but there's a song called N-Words in Paradise, right? And you're basically celebrating, it's Jay-Z and Kanye West, and they're basically celebrating being able to go to Paris and spend money, you know? Why people love that? The whole audience is like, yeah, we're N-Words in Paradise. Or we're N-Words in Paris, you know? Uh, uh, but, like, a lot of the music, F the Police, like, sure. I, in fact, there's a song called Black Cop. I think Black Cop? No, no, Sound of the Police. I went to one concert in my life, pretty much, right? It was it was Karis One, had to, right? Karis One goes, and he's rapping, and, and, you know, he's singing Sound of the Police. Sound of the Police is a nice anti-police song, right? Now, of course, there's police there, right? And so you look around and see what the police are doing while you're singing Sound of the Police, and they dancing <laughs> and rapping along. I mean, I mean, obviously, the police I saw was like a black cop, but I think some of the white cops, too, which is, yeah, this is a vibe. You know, uh, I'll do it. I'll do it. Sure. Like, whoop, whoop. That's not sound of the police. All right. Anyway. But yeah, they, they, they were singing that along with, with, with Karis One, along with the crowd. You know, uh, that tragedy, that, that poetry, that's what they like. Now, I'm not going to say they don't like the, 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 the books either. Because, you know, you know, when, when, when uh, whatever, so-and-so, whatever their names are, they write a novel or a short story or an essay, you know. It's on the front page. It's one of the biggest things. It, you know, it's on. It's it's gonna have a million dollar deal or what have you. You know. So yeah, the colonizer. Now now, why the colonizer likes it? You know, probably because you're not shooting him. You know, probably because if you if you uh you know I actually saw my book the other day. My book is big, right? Saw my book, and I'm like, yeah, you know, when you look at this book, you like, yeah, this person put a lot of work into it. But if I put a lot of work in that, white boy figure, hey. You're not putting a lot of work in, in loading that, that, that pistol. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> now, nah, you can figure that out all you want. But what I'm saying is that, you know, that might be what it is. You know? And a lot of times, this tragedy, like the tragedy, the poetry, the little crybaby, oh, no, I'm a victim. Like, like, that's another thing, too. White people could, like, like that. You know? Just just, just telling you what it, what it is. You know, when you rapping about, oh, I'm so down and depressed. Oh, I'm such a loser. Oh, I just want some money. Oh, I just, you know, like... Like, white people probably like that because that means they could buy you. You know? If, you, if, if, if for instance, if a, if a homeless person, right? Or not even a homeless person, but if somebody comes to me saying, man, I just wish I had five. I wish I just would have had $200. I just need $200. Oh, man, what I would do for $200, right? Now, if I got $5,000, right? Right? I know you could be my slave. If you want to do anything for $200 and I give you 5,000, you know, I, I, I want you guys to look at, I put it on, on I put it on the, the discord too. Uh, but there's this, uh, there's this video. It was, it was, it was trending. So I saw it on Twitter and it's this dude called, it's, it's called broke Bobby. So look at broke Bobby and broke Bobby is basically a video of this white boy talking about his list of friends and, and you know, like his, his friends and he called the, the, the brokest one, the, the one with the lowest income broke bobby right and so you look at this dude's income broke bobby's income and it's 125,000 a year 125,000 dollars u.s dollars a year and he's broke to this white boy you understand now uh, allegedly the white boy had like some other friends who made less obviously but uh well he well, he, well apparently they had one friend that was making 97,000 they call and he was part of the welfare 10 you know, and obviously they had other friends who was like making like 20 something thousand. So, you know, but like a part of the welfare 10 was somebody with 97. And, 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 it, and, it, and it tells you something about what the rich of America have and how the rich of America see the world, you know, because, you know, uh, Homeboy Mchaka is a fan of this dude named, uh, um, I think Kevin Samuels or something, right? And this guy is calling a black person, I don't know what the income number is, but he's saying that some black people have high value if they have this sort of income, right? And that same kind of income in the same range, I don't know if it's high or low, I don't know. But that same kind of income is considered broke to white folk. You know, white folk of, of a particular standing. 
Not all white folk, no. But white folk of a particular standing think that's broke. Whereas you might think that's high value. You might think that's a lot. And that's 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 the difference. You know? So 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 no, sorry. What I mean is that now if you have a black person saying, Oh, you got a uh, hundred twenty five thousand dollars and you you must be a high value individual, right? A person making five million dollars a year is like, wow, you know, I feel good. Or I, or I feel like I did something. Or, or you know, if, if I if I give a if I give a black person a job and he gets one hundred twenty five thousand, he feels highly valued, and he you know and he he'll do whatever I want. You know, his community respects him, his community likes him. He'll do like he'll do whatever I want because I just gave him something. I lifted him up, you know, to to a broke status for me, but I lifted him up, and he's feeling himself. He's feeling himself. So yeah, why you would like that? You know? And look, I'm not gonna call somebody with $125,000 broke. You know? <laughs> Just in case somebody thinking I am. But but that's that's like you got you like you peeping what I'm saying. I hope. Uh uh, what's his face? Uh Revolutionary uh, what's up, face? Revolutionary Richard says Wazungu relishes in pain. Yeah, he relishes in pain, yeah. Kofi says white people like hip hop because it's in line with their culture, e.g., calling black people the N word, that's true too, you know? Uh, that's true too, in the sense of, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, like, like that's what the N word in Paris, they, they loved it. Like, like that was the controversy. That's why I don't even mess with Nas, uh, because, like, some white girl, like Cameron Diaz, I think, was saying the N word for the song. And then people were just like, hey, you can't say that. And then Nas was like, she can say whatever she want. And I'll beat up anybody who says otherwise. And you're like, this Negro. You know? <laughs> you know? But anyway. Uh, uh, Rose Shade says, they write country music, but consume and finance toxic hip hop. Hip hop. Not all hip hop is toxic. Yeah, that's true. And then Mchaka's trying to defend his his homie, his uh, his uh, his inspiration, his, his, his role model, uh, by saying money is only a part of it. Yeah, okay. I mean, I'm not saying it, I'm not saying it wasn't, but uh, the point being that no, the 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 the, the lesson there you don't got to defend your, your your boy. The lesson there is more so <laughs> along the lines of that's not high value. That's not a high value to somebody with money. That's a low value with somebody with money. That, that's what I, that's what I'm pointing out. That 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 if 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 you were a wealthy white person, you would not say. Hey, I'm a high value individual for making 125. Hey, 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 hey. respect to my name. Don't be throwing all that mess up. Yo, your, your inspiration. Uh, yo, <laughs> you, yo, don't be doing all that, bro. You just know, stick, you, stick know, it's the <laughs> you know, it's the inspiration. You know, it's the inspiration, man. You got to say this. Now I'm back to my meeting. You I'm going back to my lab. <laughs> He knows this is a rage. I don't know why you trying to play. Look, man, you can't look. You can't throw people over the internet. That don't make no sense. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, get your get your airplane ticket. Then might, maybe I might consider what I'm saying. Right? <laughs> Not this best family. All right. So anyway, uh, now nah, that's my boy. I'm talking. He's a good guy. I mean, he, he that is his role model, but he's a good guy. Uh, listen, man, just stop the cap. All right. Just says most of them believe that you are poor if you do not have at least a million plus on liquidity. Yeah. Yeah, at least a, at least a million plus. Yeah, I mean, because what else would you be like to these people? Like, like they're saying to themselves, like, like he does the work. Here's a spreadsheet, and he's like, how much money are they willing to spend? Like, what's the maximum amount of money they're willing to spend on on a seven day vacation? And they Excuse wrote down one hundred twenty five thousand. Yeah. Excuse me. I, I wanted to make sure that I was clear because I didn't say when I said ten. And I meant ten because if you are a single digit millionaire, you broke to them. Oh, you said ten? Oh no, it's a, it don't say ten. But okay, yeah, 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 ten million, yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's what I'm saying, like, 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 like that's the thing. It's like I was, I, like, like what what it was was that uh, they had a spreadsheet and they were like, how much are you willing to spend on a three day vacation? How much are you willing to spend on a seven day vacation? And the seven day vacation, a lot of them was like, "Oh, I'm willing to spend one hundred twenty five thousand dollars." You understand? Now, 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 now for seven days. You understand? That's different from. And some of them was like, "Oh, how much paid time leave you got?" So you guys go look at that video, broke Bobby. 
just look it up on you on Twitter or or TikTok if you want, or you can go on Discord and go looking funny or whatever. But you know the spread because they show the spreadsheet and it's like uh, how much paid time off do you have, right? And some of them are like, oh, I got 25 days, I got seven days, I got eight days. Some of them are like, I got no limit to my paid time off. Plus, I'm making five million a year. You understand? There's a difference. Um, so, so Revolution Mason, you know, said she meant to say ten million dollars. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, yeah. If you, if you if you don't got that, then you don't got it. Like you 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 you're not high value. You broke. But 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 you but you but you feeling yourself, cause 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 Wazungu cut you a little bit of uh, a change. You feeling yourself because you get to you know you get to get a you get to get two pieces of crumbs instead of one. You know what I mean? I got two crumbs. You know I'm I'm high value. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? I got two crumbs. I'm high value. No, you ain't high value, fool. You know what I'm saying? You just, you just, a, you just a slave in a suit. No disrespect. You know what I'm saying? There's actually a video. I don't know if y'all saw this. There's a video trending right now on Twitter where a bunch of dudes is just walking around in suits. I mean, like the suits look dapper and fresh. You know, ain't gonna cap. Suits look fresh, but that ain't power. That ain't wealth. That's just you in a suit. You in an expensive outfit. You trying to look like Wazungu. That's all it is. And you know, sure. I'm just, I'm just gonna tell it like an IS is. All right. So mainly consumers during the period of uh, oppression, the intelligentsia turns productive. Uh, yeah. So he was talking about that. So I told you guys that. Uh, but such situations cannot last. In fact, the advances made by national consciousness among the people modify and clarify the literary creation of the colonized intellectual. The people's staying power stimulates the intellectual to transcend the lament. Complaints followed by indictments give way to appeals. Then comes the call for revolt. The crystallization of the national consciousness will not only radically change the literary genres and themes, but also create a completely new audience. Whereas the colonized intellectual started out by producing works exclusively with the oppressor in mind, either in order to charm him or to denounce him, him by using ethnic or subjectivist categories, he gradually switches over to addressing himself to his people. So that's another thing. So he's saying that the art, and this is a, this is a kind of weird, but like art would sometimes be geared toward the colonists, and then sometimes be geared towards the the masses. You know, I feel like this, for instance, this this book, I don't know who was really geared towards. Uh, I think it like like you know it's like a, almost a blend. But there are other works that it's more clearly, like it's more evident that it's geared towards uh, the intellectuals or the white intellectuals, you know? Uh, actually, I could say, for instance, like this, like Dr. Ben, I want to say, maybe. I'm not too sure. I'm not, I, I don't remember exactly. But like sometimes you're reading it and it's like he's kind No, 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 no. Dr. Ben's talking to the people. Dr. Ben's talking to the people. Uh, I don't remember what book, but there's some books where you just like you're reading it and you're like, yeah, you're talking to white folk, you know? Should I should I like like deliver it to them or something? You know what I mean? Like, it's it's different, but you know, it is what it is. Uh, it is only from the point onward that one can speak of a national. Oh no, actually, wait, sorry, that's actually pretty easy. Like Black Lives Matter, like that. Black Lives Matter. It's like who are you telling that to? Is it to the people or is it to the white establishment? You know, like clearly. Uh, like clearly there are, there are, there are, or, or like Dr. King, I have a dream and blah, blah. He's talking to the white establishment. Uh, you're talking to the white establishment. A lot of people are just talking to the white establishment. Some people are talking to the people. Like, like you, like I said, Malcolm X would be talking to the people. Uh, but like Dr. King might've been talking to white folk, you know? Uh, NWCP is talking to white folk, you know? Uh, now there's a reason for that when white people are like the center of power. But this is where he's also talking about is that, you know, you can address the people, bring them to revolt, bring them to revolution, and they will be that power in a sense, you know? And that's really the difference. Um, uh, and not power, power, but like if you're trying to get some land from these white people, you probably have to take it. You know what I mean? That's, that's really like the gist of it. So it is only from the point onward that one can speak of a national culture. Literary creation addresses. <laughs> I'm mad, homie. Left this meeting. 
<laughs> All right. It's only from the point onward that one can speak of a national literature. Literary creation addresses and clarifies typically nationalist themes. This is a combat literature in the true sense of the word, in the sense that it calls upon a whole people to join in the struggle of the existence of a nation. Combat literature, because it informs the national consciousness, gives it shape and contours, and opens up new unlimited horizons. Combat literature, because it takes charge, because it resolves. It's resolved, situated in historical time. At another level, oral literature, tales, epics, and popular songs previously classified in frozen time begin to change. The storytellers who recite inert episodes revive them and introduce uh, increasingly fundamental changes. There are attempts to update battles and modernize the type of struggle, uh, the heroes' names and the weapons used. The method of illusions is increasingly used. Uh, Oh, okay, so you're saying that sometimes you would update your, your old stuff, you know, because like you might be like, oh, and then we, we ran after their horses, and, you know, there's no more horses, so we ran after their tanks. You know what I mean? Like, you just update it. The methods of illusion is increasingly used. Instead of a long time ago, they substitute the more ambiguous expression. What I'm going to tell you happened somewhere else, but it could happen here today or perhaps tomorrow, you know? Like, instead of saying a long time ago, we, we, we rushed these, these, uh, these, 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 you know, we rushed the castle, you know? You say, what I'm telling you happened somewhere else, but it could happen here. A uh, 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 people rushed cannons, you know? Like, like, or people rushed, you know, the drones, you know? Whatever it is, it's, you know, you're telling this so that you could inspire a change. And this is actually something that's really important, you know? We kind of, I'm kind of reading over it like it isn't, but combat literature and this is why you want, that's why you want to read and you want to get some more information. I'm going to admit, I, I'm going to say, Fanon is a better example of a socialist thinker than a lot of the socialist thinkers today. So you might engage a different socialist today and think that you're doing something, and you might think so, right? You might think so. But you really should just engage Fanon because he was better than them. He's not that great. He's not that good, but he's better than them. So... At least this right here is a good nugget. Combat literature is something that we should really be serious about. You know? Uh, again, I'll just repeat it from just whatever. Oral literature, tales, epics, popular songs, uh, frozen in time, change them. Change those and make them, update them, modernize them. Right? Update the battles, modernize the struggles, the names, and the weapons used. No longer saying it's a long time ago. Say, hey, look, this might have happened somewhere else. But it could happen today, maybe even tomorrow. In this respect, the case of Algeria is significant. From 1952 to 53 on, its storytellers grown stale and dull radically changed both their methods of narration and the content of their stories. Once scarce, the public returned in droves. The epic, with its standardized forms, reemerged. It became an authentic form of entertainment that once again had taken on cultural value. Colonialism knew full well what it was doing when it began systematically arresting these storytellers after 1955. So, so you see, you see, like, like for instance, you go. In, well, this in Mali, what they do is they uh, have these griots, right? And the griots would tell you the tale of Sanjata sometimes, right? A lot of them would specialize in this tale of Sanjata. And so they would tell it, and people would listen. And they listen because it, form, it helps them with their identity. Because you're talking about different characters, and your family can trace its roots back to these different characters, you know? Uh, so that's interesting, right? However, what he's saying is that you might have these storytellers, like, let's say, in Algeria, right? And they're telling these stories of, oh, this great battle, you know, once upon a time, Sinbad, when after, you know, whatever, right? And people are just like, yeah, I don't really care. I got television, or I got a job, or I got so on and so forth. But eventually, they started retelling these same stories, but change them, you know? Change the content, change the method, change it so that it's now like, hey, you know, once upon a time, we were free. And we blah, 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 blah. You know, and we fought these people. And they, were, they thought they couldn't be beaten, but we beat them. And blah, 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 blah. And then eventually, uh, yeah, I mean, so, and so what happens is that now colonists see this. They start arresting people. Say, no, 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 no more of that. And the people are going in to, to watch it. You know, I remember this one song from the Vietnamese War, right? This is Swedish people are singing this Vietnamese song. And I can see the translation. And it's a, it's a, it's a pretty catchy tune. But it's... It's like, you know, it's a pro-communist song, but it's like, that's, that's what people are doing. Like, you're singing about combat. You're singing about battle. In that song, they're talking about America's a paper tiger, you know? Uh, and, I mean, that's a famous phrase that China has, pretty much. But it's like, 
Yeah, they, they might be able to scare you. Like, you might be scared of a paper tiger, right? I mean, you shouldn't be scared of a paper tiger. Because although it looks like a tiger, it's made out of paper. You know? That's why a lot of, like, like, we're not doing that. And because we're not doing that, you know, we're looking at other people defeat this colonial power. While we sit down and watch, you know? While we, you know, Marcus, uh, Bob Marley, you know, while we stand aside and look, you know, all right, the people's, I, I got, I got to do like a uh, revolutionary matron. She be singing during the program, I, I, <laughs> but she got the voice. Uh, uh, let's see. So I see some comments. Um, uh, revolutionary matron clarifies: you are broke if you have less than ten million dollars, right? Additionally, if you work for money, you are still broke, right? And then uh, Melanin one hundred percent comes in. And says shalom, right? Um, so peace to you, sister uh, or brother. I, I can't really tell. I mean, the avatar makes it seem like sister, but you know, I can't. Uh, you know, I'm not gonna make an ass out of myself, right? Uh, the people's encounter with this new song of heroic deeds brings an urgent breath of excitement, arouses forgotten muscular tensions, and develops the imagination. Uh, the people's encounter with this new song of heroic deeds brings an urgent, yeah, urgent breath, rouses forgotten muscular tension and develops the imagination. Every time the storyteller narrates a new episode, the public is treated to a real invocation. The existence of a new type of man is revealed to the public. The present is no longer turned inward, but channeled in every direction. The storyteller once again gives free reign to his imagination, innovates, and turns creator. It even happens that unlikely characters for such a transformation, social misfits such as outlaws or drifters, are rediscovered and rehabilitated. Close attention should be paid to the emergence of the imagination and the inventiveness of songs and folktales in a colonized country. The storyteller responds to the expectations of the people by trying and error and searches for a new model national models apparently on his own but in fact with the support of his audience comedy and farce disappear or else lose their appeal as for drama it is no longer the domain of the intellectual's tormented conscious no longer characterized by despair and revolt it has become the people's daily lot it has become part of an action of the making of the already in progress yeah so native son was this book about by richard wright and it's about this 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 brother who like accidentally kills a white woman and then just runs for his life and of course like the socialists try to save him and yada yada uh i made a little play off of it i think it was like native daughter or something like that but um but the 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 thing i want to say about that is that yeah the richard the, the character richard right i think the name of the protagonist is like bigger thomas like some i saw the reason why i read this book because i saw an article that said bigger thomas was the original malcolm x you know, Bigger Thomas was like that rebellious black person who just wouldn't, you know, sit back or wouldn't take it. You know, you know, he would, he would stand up. And, and there were a lot of Bigger Thomases at the time. You know, basically the art was reflecting a, 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 a revolt, a, a different type of black person, a new, you know. And, and this is something that here's the issue I have is that a lot of times things happen in cycles. So just like the Harlem Renaissance there was this, the new African. The Marcus Garvey, what he was talking about was the new African, the new Negro, and all that kind of stuff. Like, we continually have that. Burkina Faso is what? The land of the upright men. You know, we still have that, this new, 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 and we go back into sinking into the low. And then we say, oh, no, there's going to be a new one. So, like, today, we're like, there's going to be a new consciousness, or there's the new black person, or we're woke, or we're conscious, or we're blah, blah, blah. And then we sink back into the same pattern. So, you know, I, I think that, you know, you have to do more, obviously. You have to do more, and you can't just say, oh, it's this, that's, this, this equals that. But uh, definitely this is a good thing. You know, comic literature is a good thing. But you also have to bear in mind that, you know, it's been tried before. Uh, not to say that it, it didn't work because it was, was tried. Uh, or, uh, just to say that it's, like, at the end of the day, you want to be free. You have to take up. Uh, you, have to, you have to combat. You have to really combat. Uh, uh, and that's what that's what that's what free people have done. Uh, in artisanship, 
the congealed petrified forms loosen up. Wood carvings, for example, which turned out set faces and poses by the thousands start to diversify. The expressionless or tormented mask comes to life and the arms are raised upwards in a gesture of action. Compositions with two, three, or five figures emerge. An avalanche of amateurs and dissidents encourage the traditional schools to innovate. This new stimulus in this particular cultural sector very often goes unnoticed, yet its contribution to the national struggle is vital. By bringing faces and bodies to life, by taking the group set on a single circle as creative subjects, the art inspires concerted action. I tell you guys, my feet really hurt when I'm standing this long. <laughs> I'll be standing up the entire time. Uh, but it's, it's good, right? It sounds good, right? Uh, Melanin 100 Cent says female. Okay, nice. Um, but I kind of figured from the avatar. Uh, so, yeah, peace again. Uh, the awakening co national consciousness has had a somewhat similar effect in the sphere of ceramics and pottery. Formalism is abandoned. Jugs, jars, and trays are reshaped at first only slightly and then quite radically. Colors. So he's saying that you're going to have this new culture. You're, you're forming this new culture as you're fighting against the other people. But again, we have this, the Renaissance, the, the Black Renaissance, the Negritude movement. We have, and they lead to something. They lead to stuff, right? You could trace back uh, acts to this sort of cultural transformation, right? This sort of uh, pushing back against the colonial situation. So I'm not necessarily saying don't, like, like, like let's like, ignore it. Uh, I'm just saying that like you got to see the parallel, you know, but the main thing is that you have to you have to like if you're getting ready to fight, you have to also fight. If you're promoting the fight, you have to also fight. And then when you do fight, you have to win. If you don't win, then it's almost like nothing happened. You know, there's this story I, I tell you guys inside of the Book of Power. Actually, I might have uh, give you like a little bit of it. But uh, Dessalines is telling us that there was this revolution. Uh, like near Haiti, like in another country near Haiti, that the French won. And so we don't talk about it. You know? Like, like the black folk got up and we're like, we're tired of this. We're going to fight. And like it was a big dramatic, dramatic scene. I think it was like actually a mulatto guy. A uh, big dramatic scene where he ends up exploding himself and the boat that he's on. Because he's like, F your colonial system. And he can't win. They're like, surrender, we're going to kill you, surrender, <laughs> I guess, right? And he just explodes the ship and with himself on it, you know? Beautiful story. It impacted and inspired people in Haiti, because Dessalines heard of it. But that's all it is. Like, today, we don't know who he is, you know? Uh, like, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> like, I wrote the freaking book, and I don't know. You know, <laughs> I, mean, I, I don't think I put his name in it, but, you know. Uh, but all the same, like, I just don't know. Uh, uh but anyway, uh, jugs, jars, and trays are reshaped at first only slightly and then quite radically. Mm -hmm. Colors once restricted in numbers governed by laws of traditional harmony flood back, reflecting the effect of the revolutionary upsurge. Certain ochres and certain blues that were apparently banned for eternity in a given cultural context emerge unscathed. Likewise, a taboo of representing the human face, typical of certain clearly defined regions, according to sociologists, is suddenly lifted. The metropolitan anthropologists and Experts are quick to note these changes and denounce them all, referring rather to a codified artistic style and culture developing in tune with the colonial situation. The colonialist experts do not recognize these new forms and rush to the rescue of indigenous conditions. It is the colonialist who becomes the defenders of indigenous style. A memorable example, that one that takes on particular significance because it does not quite involve a colonial reality, was the reaction of white jazz fans when after the Second World War, new styles such as bebop established themselves. For them, jazz could only be the broken, desperate yearnings of an old Negro, five whiskeys under his belt, bemoaning his own misfortune and the racism of the whites. As soon as he understands himself and apprehends the world differently, as soon as he elicits a glimmer of hope and forces the racist world to retreat, it is obvious he will blow his horn to his heart's content and his husky voice will ring out loud and clear. The new jazz style are not only born out of economic competition, they are one of the definite consequences of the inevitable, though gradual, defeat of the Southern universe in the USA. And it, will, and it is not unrealistic to think that in 50 years or so, that the type of jazz lament hiccuped by poor, miserable Negroes will be defended by only those whites believing in a frozen image of a certain type of relationship and a certain form of negative. You know? Okay, some of y'all, <laughs> I might have read that one too fast, but like, shit. Like, so anyway, but what he's saying is that uh, 
Because see, I could actually identify what he's talking about. Sometimes, you know, you name it some music genres and you're like, I don't know those genres in Africa, <laughs> you know? But he's talking about black America, so I know them, right? So he's saying that uh, after World War II, there was a new style of music for black folk, and that was bebop, right? And because bebop uh, was coming about, right, like white folk were like, no, 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 stick to jazz. You know, jazz is how you sing your misfortune and, oh, I don't like racism, you know? Uh, so, like, you do, and that, that was another example. I forget, like, I, I, I said hip hop today, but yeah, jazz would be like one of those examples where they're like, oh, yeah, look at this Negro, look at him cry over how I treat him, you know? Uh, it sounds so beautiful how he tries, how he cries. So they're like, no, don't move to bebop. I don't know how bebop, I don't, I can't say per se how bebop sounds. I'm thinking, uh, no, nah, see, I'm mixing it up with uh, bebops. <laughs> but like, I think bebop might have that skedaddles, get out of do, you know? Uh, maybe I'm not too sure. Uh, I, I mean, I mean, uh, yeah, I'm. I don't know. Uh, yeah, somebody else can tell me. Uh, but actually, let me go check the comments and see if somebody corrects me. Uh, no. Okay. So yeah, bebop. Point is that it might have a different flair. You know, jazz. Oh my baby. You know, whatever. Right. And then bebop might be. You know, whatever. Like <laughs> you guys get it. Right. Uh, because of that. Right? White folk were like, no, 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 no. Go back to go back to how you were crying before. You know, I want to hear your tears. You know? Uh, I, I, you know, if you guys ever saw, you guys heard this show called South Park, you know, this little Cartman was like licking somebody's face because they were crying or something like that. Like, that's what white folk want to do to you. Like, they just want to hear you crying. And so he's like, no, jazz changed and basically, you know, it moved from the South and so on and so forth. And he's like, it won't be surprising. It's not unrealistic to think that in 50 years, so that's my today. Right, that the only people defending jazz, right, are white folk. Or like, who's preserving jazz, making a real preservation effort for the old jazz music? It's white folk. And sure enough, right? Cause I remember when I was in in, in college, I wanted to learn uh, swing dancing. If you really want to go and learn swing dancing, and you know, do some swing dancing, or you know, whatever social dancing, uh, it's gonna be a bunch of white folk there. There's gonna be a handful of black folk there. But it's going to be a whole bunch of white folk. You know? That's what he's talking about. When, when I tell, like, like, even when we talk about hip hop, uh, like right now, black folks still like the old music, you know, sure. But like, come 50 years, right? I mean, sure, we might still kick it to that. But like, white folk, we're going to be kicking it. Like, 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 That's I. That's already actually, happening, bro, in Europe. Yeah, 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 but like, I remember, cause I, the first time I went to a club, I went to a club in Manhattan, right? And it was like a white club, I didn't know, I, didn't, I was just like, swanky. swanky. I'm 21 or whatever, right? Uh, nah, there's a whole bunch of clubs in Manhattan, man, it's not just swanky. Uh, actually, I don't uh, know what swanky is, but... but no, no, I only seen them in movies, so I don't know. I never heard of that, man. <laughs> but like, anyway, but like uh, I mean, I was going to one of them with no cover charge, you know? Uh, so it wasn't like... You know, something that's gonna be on a movie. You know, <laughs> like that like celebrities in there. Yeah, like, 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 like celebrities in there. You know, what I'm saying? like, like I bump into Rihanna or something. No, uh, but but the thing is that uh, do I say Rihanna in every podcast? <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> you do. <laughs> you know, I'm bringing up Rihanna. <laughs> we know you got a thing for her. I don't blame you. <laughs> oh yeah, hey, well, I'm real Rihanna every day of podcast. Nah, I'm just joking. Uh, no, nah, it's either Rihanna. Rihanna. Those are only two celebrities I know. Like I said, you know, like. Like, as the music goes forward. But anyway, point is that they had, like, a 90s music appreciation thing. And it was just a bunch of 90s. And, you know, I could still kick it with the 90s music. You know, uh, 90s music was nice. Uh, everybody know that. But, you know, eventually. But, like, it was only white folk. And, I mean, it's partly the bias that we have, you know. Uh, but that's another thing, too. Like, it's partly the bias that we have. But it's also not partly the bias we have. Like, when I say bias, I mean... Uh, you know, you might be looking at it like, oh, we see white people playing this music and, you know, we don't see black people. But the thing is that because black people are going to use the latest culture, you know, like black young people are going to do the latest music and black people of uh, are going to use and black, black older people are going to do the music of their age. But the thing with white folk is that they don't just do the latest music for black folk. They do particular black genres, you know, like they look at us from a genre perspective. So we look at it from a current, you know, current music perspective. They look at it from a genre perspective. So they like, oh yeah, jazz is such a good, you know, blah, blah, blah. Do you like jazz, 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 you know? 
Uh, whereas, and I, and even young folk would be like, like I said, you go to the swing dance, and it's not just the old folk doing it. You know, it might be like an old black person, like, oh, I can finally dance my, you know, whatever. But you know, what you know about this? Yeah, he's exactly. like, what you know about this one? <laughs> you know, but like, you won't find, but like, you would find young white folk. You know, like, 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 even like young white folk. You know, like, I'm not gonna say I saw any young young people, but like, I wouldn't be surprised if like a 13 year old. <laughs> Was learning but I, think, I don't think that's that's, that's even with, with black music. music. You can see, you can see in a lot of white, white music, they'll, they'll still, still, you know, respect, respect uh, their older art from the older rock band. Still, still can tour successfully, successfully now. now. Uh, you know, all that, all that kind of stuff. stuff. Probably old, old people though. I think I think the the, the no, but I'm, that's what I'm telling you, like you know, they'll they'll still support them. You see them wearing like the memorabilia, all that kind of stuff. They'll still support it. The young people and and they were yeah they revere those older artists, and older groups. Oh, for real? I don't know. I don't know. Like I said, I don't really know white folk like that. You know what I mean? Like, 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 like I'm going to go over what Automatic said. He said, if a white person got my phone number, you should call the police. Because ain't no damn way. <laughs> ain't, no, ain't no reason for them to have my phone number. You know what I'm saying? No. But anyway. Uh, uh, but anyway, let's go. Uh, we would also uncover the same transformations, the same progress, and the same eagerness if we inquired into the fields of dance, song, rituals, and traditional ceremonies. Well before the political or armed struggle, a careful observer could sense and feel in the arts the pulse of a fresh stimulus and the coming combat. Unusual forms of expression, original themes no longer invested with the power of invocation, but the power to rally and mobilize with the approaching conflict in mind. Everything conspires to stimulate the colonized sensibility and to rule out and reject attitudes of inertia or defeat. By imparting new meaning and dynamicism to artisanship, dance, music, literature, and the oral epic, the colonized subject restructures his own perception. The world no longer seems doomed. The conditions are ripe for the inevitable confrontation. Speaking of that, so uh, uh, Revolutionary Machin put out earlier uh, in parentheses, you know, not all hip hop is toxic. You know, hip hop used to be like, like, like I remember sitting in a history class. I'm a history class, this white boy. Uh, actually, it's funny, like I just said. This white boy is like, like he's the teacher, right? And he's like, it's like AP European history, in fact. It's, I don't know why I can go into that too. But the teacher is saying, oh, yeah, hip hop used to be rebel music, radical music, you know, fight the power and blah, blah. blah. And he, was, he would name these rap artists that I didn't even know about at the time, right? Because I couldn't, like, I'm the current, you know, I'm like Nas and Jay Z and all that. And he's talking about, you know, the people before, you know, Public Enemy and so on and so forth. But I'm not really catching on because I don't know who he's saying, right? Either way, he's like, it used to be rebel music. And, you know, it used to be, you know, people were against crack in the community. And it used to be, you know, coming together and, and practicing black unity, so on and so forth. And, and so, you know, of course, you know, later on I figure out and find out that that's, that was true. Uh, but it, it goes to show as well... Uh, like, like what white folks systematically do, you know? Because what, what Fanon is talking about is how black folk would come up with a new culture, a new tradition, a new way of doing things. They would buck against their older things. They buck against the things without meaning, without, without revolutionary capability, without any sort of fix the community kind of thing, you know? Just that, like the disco age and the disco era of dancing, as far as we're concerned, which it might not have started out as either. Or the or the uh, the the jazz age of crying, which it might have developed into, but it might not have started off. Right now, we have the hip hop age, which is you know, oh yeah, misogyny or you know, patriarchy or whatever, you know, whatever you want to use the feminist terms, right? But you're you're you know, it wasn't it start out like that. It was give back the crack or say no to drugs or or, or something like that or, or take back the community or 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 give so back forth. the crack. Like like. Like like don't take it. I don't know. Okay. Like the, 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 <laughs> like they used to rhyme it. They used to rhyme it. You know what I'm saying? Like I, look, man. I, look, I'm not a. I'm not a. I'm not a. You know, I'm not a rapper. Give I can't just think crack. of. Think crack of. Is whack. <laughs> you said what? I said give back, back the crack. Crack, crack, crack is whack. whack. Yeah, crack is whack. That was actually the one. Uh, that was actually a real one, by the way. I don't know. You, you might think you just made it up, but that was actually a real one. But uh, but yeah, yeah, yeah. So like they uh, yeah, like like the music. Like, like, he's talking about how music was like that. And I'm saying, like, we go through cycles. Because eventually you're going to get some, possibly, you know, you could get some, uh, you know, Black Lives Matter music turning big. Nah, you know? we threw. Yeah, yeah, we threw. You're right. 
<laughs> I was I was trying to be optimistic, but you're right. We threw. All right, uh, we were we 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 have witnessed the emergence of a new energy in the cultural sphere. We have seen that the energy, these new forms, are linked to the maturing of a national consciousness, and now become increasingly objectified and institutionalized. Hence, the need for nationhood at all costs. A common mistake, hardly defensible, moreover, is to attempt cultural innovations and reassert the value of indigenous culture within the context of colonial domination. Hence, we arrive at a seemingly paradoxical proposition in a colony country, nationalism in its most basic, most rudimentary and undifferentiated form is the most forceful and effective way of defending national culture. Okay, so, okay, so that's what I'm saying, nationalism, so that's what I'm saying, you, again, I, I want people to understand this, all right? The socialists are like, oh, nationalism is so stupid, they're so, so, but if you're being honest, it's nationalism that works, you know what I'm saying? So, so let's read this again because he does promote nationalism right here. And like, I was going to read it. Don't don't like they don't like white, white nationalism. nationalism. That's what it is. No, I mean, they don't like, well, apparently they don't like black nationalism either. That's the thing. So, uh, like, whoa, whoa. Bump down. you said what? <laughs> Bump down. Who cares? Okay, well, like, again, like, Huey Newton will call black nationalists uh, pork chop nationalists or something like that, you know? Okay, we saw what happened to Huey Newton. Dang, bro, you going to really go after Huey Newton? You know, I, I got to say this. I want to say this. I, I, because nobody listening, so I could say it, right? <laughs> yeah, nobody listening. <laughs> I mean, you guys are listening. You guys are cool, though, all right? Uh, but, like, y'all really did this dude dirty. Uh, the, the, the chairman of the Black Panther Party is Bobby Seale. The dude's yeah. alive right now. They're, I'm, I'm, I'm saying, like, they're about to be forgetting. It's like everybody else, but the people that actually still here. <laughs> they don't even care about the guy. Like, yo. And I mean, like, because I, I tell you guys that my, my uh, ex wife was, like, a little conscious or something. So, so forth. She said that they invited him to. You said what? She had a dash of consciousness. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Bro, you, yeah, you, anyway, this guy respected us, so let's stop playing. Anyway, but, like, what I'm saying is this. So she's doing like some university. She, she, she's uh, you know, she's in some black organization in her school or whatever. And they invite this guy Bobby. Mm-hmm. To talk about the Black Panther Party, and she, she, her impression, the impression of a lot of people in the audience was that the brothers just, the brothers just came here to talk about the barbecue sauce he's selling. <laughs> uh, he trying to eat. <laughs> he was like selling barbecue sauce. It's like he retired. Like, the man is retired. Okay. I'm just like <laughs> yo, cool like like. Sauce. You know, damn right, like nobody brought you out of, you know, but it's like, but it's like, y'all mad disrespectful in the way that this dude is like, not only is he alive, he's on Twitter. Like, he was like one of the people I was like, wait, Bobby Seale's alive? Okay, let me go follow him. And I Sweet Seal like, Huh? Sweet Seal sauce. It's, it's like, yo, you can go get some Seal sauce. Like, like, damn, y'all do this dude dirty. Hold on. Got that honey barbecue. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Hardy barbecue. It was just, uh, it's just like, yeah, it just didn't even make any, it just didn't even make any sense, you know? He, uh, he retired, man. <laughs> nah, it's just like, but that's what I'm saying, like, you know, you got these people just fighting for, 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 for liberation, or you're fighting for the, the redemption of your people, and, and like, like, that's the thing that, like, we kind of just skip over it, you know? Like, we really yeah. skip over the fact that this guy is alive and you don't really make him any kind of hero. You don't make like he got a hustle to live, and then but but then. Well, but, well I think well, that's, that's even part of it. The fact he has, he has to hustle, hustle to live now. Right? Exactly. That's like and then but meanwhile we just always yeah we we the black Panthers. This is what our culture did and this is what we produce. And it's like oh, well, yeah. this is the chairman, the uh, people founder. People say name dropping and quote uh, from the from the Zoom accounts. Yeah, you know, and and, and, and the thing too is that like and the thing is that. <laughs> You bigging up Huey, you know, and then like, but like, if he were, if he was alive, what would you be doing for him, you know? Like that that's one of the the, the tragedies like in America, be honest. But that's one of the tragedies is that you yeah, would Huey uh, doing noodles. <laughs> yeah, he'd probably be pushing Huey noodles. You right? Like apparently, look. All right, nah, look. There's not that few people that I can say anything, but I know what you would probably say is that he he was pushing drugs. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> are we lying? Like, I mean, this is true. I, I wouldn't say that. You know what I mean? Because, uh, I mean, but like, bro, bro, I mean, yeah, he got his doctorate. You got to hustle. Like, you got to no, hustle. Bro, bro was on that on that narcotic. Bro, but, but, but I think they, they, they damaged him though. Crack. Like they said, crack. <laughs> you know, he, he wasn't a crack and wagons, but but I'm saying like that's one of the things that realistically speaking, uh, uh, like that's one of the problems like with our community that we have to hustle. Yeah. You know. 
Uh, now, I don't think he had to do the drugs thing. Uh, that was a little bit extreme. I think that's also a part of it, though, to be honest. It was that time period. But a lot of people didn't know how crack was going to be until they took it. You know. Well, they they drugged them bad. Real talk, they drugged Hugh Newton bad. Like they they brought him into prison and they just like messed him up. Yeah, bro bro was a shell of himself. To be honest. Yeah, well, when you when you talk about experimenting on people, that, <laughs> that's what that they did that on him, big time. Yeah. Uh, but all right, anyway, let's uh let's go. But I, I was just kind of surprised that like yeah, like they they really just turned their back on this dude and just pretend. And here's the thing, here's a here's actually the saddest thing. You know, I don't want to speak it into the universe. Uh, you know, but like if he passes away, everybody gonna be talking about him. Oh, Everybody he, gonna be he, I mean, putting he's not on. Here to hear it no more. Huh? You say? I said you gonna say all this stuff, do all these hashtags on Twitter, but they do not get to see or hear any of these. Yeah, things. exactly. They're gonna be all, oh, this is the greatest guy, and look, he started this, and oh man, I'm can you mainly, and you know they you him. Buy his they molested him, huh? You couldn't even buy his barbecue sauce. You couldn't even buy his barbecue sauce, man. Well, we're real talking. Like you, you supposed to have supported him while he's living. You should have sponsorship. Yeah, I mean, uh, look, look. Like you capping, but like the dude is literally the founder of no, the no, Black Panther I'm, I'm Party. Saying, but like, I'm, I'm saying like when I'm saying like that's I'm saying like that's some simple stuff. Like you shouldn't even be going out here peddling some sauce. Let's be honest, bro. Yeah, that don't make no sense. That's what I'm saying. Like you shouldn't, you shouldn't even like come on. I mean, be, like, I mean, the founder of the Black Panther Party. The movies they've been making, the money they've been making out his brother's name. Let's be honest. Come on, man. Like like one of the. And he's alive, like nah. it don't make sense if he passed, but he didn't. And and he, but you acting like he passed, and like I said, you're gonna be mad hype when he's gone. You're gonna be bringing up his quotes and celebrating his name. You bring up and, the quotes he made when he was like in his twenties, when you in his twenties going, going to him now for any wisdom he may have had all these years. You know? Yeah, exactly. But, you, know? you know, like all all all, all of how to make barbecue. <laughs> <laughs> See, the secret is you gotta add the vinegar. With it. <laughs> yeah, I just said that because they know because you know so few people listen. You know, I, well, I appreciate y'all. Don't don't tell nobody. Uh, the secret, the secret is the vinegar. You gotta put a little bit of vinegar. In there. Is that it? You ain't know. You there? You there? Ah, oh, I was putting it in water all this time. <laughs> <laughs> you need that twang to it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? All right. Anyway, so comment. Uh, I want to state Harley uh, defensible more for us to attempt cultural innovation to reassert the indigenous culture with the context of colonial. Uh, uh, domination. Did I read this? No, okay. Hence, we arrive at a seemingly paradoxical proposition. In a colonized country, nationalism's most basic form, most rudimentary and undifferentiated form is the most forceful and effective way of defending national culture. A culture is first and foremost the expression of a nation, its preferences, its taboos, and its models. Other taboos, other values, other models are formed at every level of the entire society. National culture is the sum of all these considerations, the outcome of tensions internal and external society as a whole and its multiple layers. In the colonial context, colonial culture when deprived of the twin supports of the nation and the state, perishes and dies. National liberation and the resurrection of the state are the preconditions for the very existence of a culture. The nation is not only a precondition for culture, it's embolition, its perpetual renewal and maturation is a necessity. First of all, it is the struggle for nationhood that unlocks culture and opens the doors of creation. Later on, it is the nation that will provide culture with their conditions and framework for expression. The nation satisfies all those indispensable requirements for culture, which alone can give it credibility, validity, dynamicism, and creativity. It is also the national character that makes culture permeable to other cultures and enables it to influence and penetrate them. That which does not exist can hardly uh, have an effect on reality or even influence it. The restoration of the nation must therefore give life in its most biological sense to the term of national culture. So again, uh, I kind of just read through this because I was just like, whatever. I was actually thinking of something, but... <laughs> you know that, that's what happens sometimes when you read it but you know you got to just tune in uh, occasionally to see like because it's going to make sense right here he's just saying that you can't have a nation you can't have a national culture without a nation you know uh again it's a little hard all right so okay what make what consists of a culture exactly a culture is? so he's just saying a national culture that's what I, that's what i'm trying to get at because okay. again when it comes to african-americans they do not have a nation or, or you could say they have a nation that's america and would, you say that have culture, though? would you say that? No, of course not. That's what I'm saying. African Americans definitely, obviously, like you just said, jazz and all that kind of stuff. That's obviously African Americans, you know? So, uh, what, cons- what makes a culture a culture? Can we define that for the audience? What ma- well, that's again. So, it depends on if you're talking to, in the sense of, of, uh, of Fanon or you're talking mm-hmm. in the sense of. of uh, the pro black perspective. Oh, yeah, that's true. Uh, but, but, but like Fanon, what Fanon is communicating, because we read in Wretched of the Earth, what Fanon is saying is that culture is that 
liberatory. Our national culture is that liberation expression, you know? So you're going through this colonial experience and your, your experience that's trying to fight that colonial experience, that is culture. That's national culture. Now, obviously, just fighting the oppressor so, is, but is not that culture just culture. Or just like um, a planned initiative to fight for liberation. Is that a exactly. Culture? So that's that's what he's promoting as culture because that's the only culture that's important. You understand? If you're uh, doing I mean, something okay. for him, for him, you get what I'm saying. Okay. So as to say that, and and look, that's actually a good mindset to work at. In it's just not the, yeah. exactly. You get what I'm saying? Because again, you're, yeah. you're 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 in a position where. African people are being colonized, you know? And yes. so you're saying, hey, you know, this is our culture, and this is the culture that we should, we, should, we should promote. And, you know, it's just you dressing up in, you know, like, 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 like a kente cloth, you know? That well, I isn't... Why can't be Ankara? What, what can it be what? Ankara. Because nobody's going to dress in that. Uh, uh, yeah, we're doing that here. Don't play with me. Don't play with me. All right, nobody fashionable is going to dress in that, right? Oh, yeah, that's crazy, man. I got some fits, man. Don't play with me. Authentic. Oh, man. Yeah, you, you got some fits. <laughs> yo, well, yo, you see why nobody like these Nigerians, though? Y'all see that, right? <laughs> they just go straight to fight. <laughs> like, no, nobody. You know what I'm saying? Always like, violent. Yeah. <laughs> Always violent, man. You just talking like, oh, what's that? You know, I'm just like, I don't know. But, <laughs> anyway, yeah. <laughs> it reminds me of this uh, joke. Uh, homeboy said it. Uh, what's his name? Uh, Dick Gregory. <laughs> Apparently, he goes to a. <laughs> What was it? He went to a a, a, a bar. No, he goes to like some segregated South place, and he says, you know, he orders some food, but you're not supposed to order no food because he's a black person, right? Now they give him like a chicken, right? And white boys come around him. You guys know the story. White boy comes around him, and they're like, anything you do to that chicken, we are gonna do to you, you know, N word. And so then, uh, the Gregory picks up the chicken and kisses it. <laughs> Everybody laughs. <laughs> they're like, you know, a little. That's funny. Yeah, what he said. Like, I said, that's funny. Yeah, yeah, that's messed up, man. I mean, like, I don't know if I kiss it, but like, yeah, but like, yeah, like, like sometimes you can diffuse you the situation. Love, yeah, yeah, well, no, I'm not. Call, well, I don't know what it was, but he made them laugh, and they kind of just backed up. And that's what I'm saying. Like that sometimes happens. Uh, so you see, you heard this. This heard this aggressive Nigerian. He was trying to fight me for some reason, and you know, he he get a laugh and he, yeah, he stopped. How that fight? You acting like a Karen right now? Okay, <laughs> fighting me. He's aggressive. I'm on the police. Relax. <laughs> Ouch. Right? Like what? <laughs> like you know, damn well. I was just, I was just, just getting at you. I wasn't even. All right, whatever. Um, all right, let's go. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, yeah. Basically, but that's that's what it is. Like your culture is you fighting, you resisting. It's so your culture would be you sitting down at the table, knowing that white folk don't want you sitting down. I don't think that's your culture. Well, I'm saying, well, I'm not you know. And that, well, you could say that's culture in general. Like jazz music, in a way, you could say it's fighting against the dominant music of that time. Yeah, well, that. so basically what he's saying, too, is, that's another way to look at it, too. Like, as I say, if you are, uh, if you are, like, just digging a hole, like, you know, you're just, you're just working on the, uh, uh, on, on a plantation, I guess, that's not culture. On the railroad. Yeah, like, you're working on the railroad, that's not, that's not culture. If you sing and, I, and I, you might be now, some of us might be like, "Well, we singing songs while we're doing it." Yeah, you are, yeah. but you know, way that, in the water. Oh, yeah. Nah, that was a different. That was a diff, that was not the railroads, my guy. That was okay, escaping. Now, 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 that was escaping the plantation, early. huh? Yeah, I got you. Fifty years before that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that was escaping the plantation, man. Uh, that was a good song. Uh, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> hey. But, but. But isn't culture sometimes defined as your way of being and connecting to other people that are like you? know, like um, the rituals, like jumping the broom, mm -hmm. or some of their holiday exactly. traditions, mm -hmm. or some of the social some of the social things that they do to rely on each other and build networks and relationships. Yeah. So I mean, that's what I'm saying. So like, I would say, for instance, culture would be something that your ancestors were doing. That you doing because your ancestors were doing it, you know what I'm saying? Uh, that, but but again, like it, it like you could see Is that where culture or tradition. Exactly, you would see where yeah. it gets it gets boggled in the sense of well, what if your ancestors were sharecroppers? You know what I'm saying? But like, their ancestors weren't sharecroppers. 
Right. So, yeah. so at what so point what do you a, have that divide? Yeah, exactly. Right. One one of the things that I think like like Fanon has pointed out and like you highlighted is that mm-hmm. as colonized people, much of our quote unquote traditional culture, it first and foremost we have to acknowledge that whatever our organic culture is, which is to be a, a a people that accept everybody. Let's start with that one. Cultural behavior that is prevalent among Africans has not served us, which is why we have to develop and create a whole, a holistic African identity mm-hmm. as a culture, and we have to accept it, the fact that you know the traditions that each of us celebrate will be different. But on the date of our liberation, we would then instantaneously as a nation have a culture because it would be like, oh, no, this Africa Freedom Day. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so, yeah, like, like you know, like when, when you celebrate the liberation, you know, like different nations celebrate their liberation date differently, but they all celebrate it the same. I mean, they all celebrate it the celebrate same time. Acknowledge yeah. Today. yeah. Yeah. Uh, what was it? So, some, apparently people in Haiti eat some soup that, uh, you know, allegedly... Soup. Yeah, so allegedly it ain't even that good, you know. <laughs> like it ain't something you would. But it's to represent. Yeah, they exactly. <laughs> and they do it. They do it for years, you know, for like a hundred, two hundred years. You know, they eating some soup that you know, like you wouldn't order by yourself, but you you eating it because that's that's you know that's what you know you fought you fought and won, uh, or your ancestors fought and won. So we have thus traced the increasingly. Uh, essential fissuring of the old cultural strata and on the eve of the decisive struggle for national liberation grasped a new form of expression and the flight of the imagination. They now, there now remains one fundamental question. What is the relationship between the struggle, the political or armed conflict and culture? During the conflict, uh, one fundamental question, what is the relationship between the struggle, the political or armed conflict and culture? Uh, okay, so he's going to talk about the relationship between the struggle, Political and armed conflict and culture. So he's going to have his definition of culture, right? So during the conflict, during the conflict, is culture put on hold? Is the national struggle a cultural manifestation? Must we conclude that the liberation struggle, though beneficial for culture, a, pro, a posteriori, is it itself a negation of culture? In other words, is the liberation struggle a cultural phenomenon? Right, so he's, he's answering the question you asked, right? So we believe the conscious, organized struggle undertaken by a colonized people in order to restore national sovereignty constitutes the greatest cultural manifestation that exists. It is not solely the success of the struggle that consequently validates the energi- and energizes culture. Culture does not go into hibernation during the conflict. The development and internal progression of the actual struggle expand the number of directions in which culture can go and hint at new possibilities. The liberation struggle does not restore to national culture its former values and configurations. This struggle, which aims at a fundamental redistribution of relations between men, cannot leave intact either the former substance of the people's culture. After the struggle is over, there is not only the demise of colonialism, but also the demise of the colonized. Basically, you're no longer colonized after the colonialism ends you know this new humanity so that so your culture as colonized individuals is gone because you're no longer colonized you know like 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 look at the uh the uh the 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 the, 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 the taliban right they are no longer hiding in caves per se like not entirely like they are no longer prohibited from theme parks or or this or that you know what i mean they're no longer following the rules of another people they are making their own rules so their culture after victory is no longer that of hunted terrorists. Now they're governors, you know, now they're governors and, and, and policemen, you know, everything changed. You're no longer the colonized. Same thing happens in the American Revolution. You know, once upon a time, you know, you were these traitors to the colony of, of, of the UK, you know, you're, you're, the British colony. You're traitors. You're, you're fighting against the British. You're so on and so forth. And then you win. You kick the British out, and you're now the administrators. You're the ones writing the Constitution. You're the ones policing the streets. You're the ones writing the laws, enforcing the laws. You're the judges and juries. You're no longer the judged. You know? That's, that's what it is. Like, like everything changes. You're, 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 your American culture now shifts. Like, what once was American culture, which would have been to be colonized, right? would be a colony of, of Britain, you know, or whatever. Now you're, you're spelling things differently, you know? You drop that useless whatever yeah. vowel it is. Yeah, you is. Yeah, yeah, color, color, color. You know, <laughs> you, you drop that you and you, uh, and you, uh, 
and and yeah, you have your own your own set of rights. You know, everything changes. You know, and I, and I could I could I could concede to that. So this new humanity for itself and for others inevitably defines a new humanism. This new humanism is written into the objectives and methods of the struggle, a struggle which mobilizes every level of society, which expresses the intentions and expectations of the people, and which is not afraid to rely on their support almost entirely, will invariably triumph. The merits of this type of struggle is that it achieves the optimal condition for cultural development and innovation. Once national liberation has been accomplished under these conditions, there is none of that tiresome cultural indecisiveness we find in certain newly and independent countries because the way a nation is born and functions exerts a n fundamental influence on culture. A nation both born of the concerted actions of the people, which embodies the actual aspirations of the people and transforms the state, depends on exceptionally inventive cultural manifestations for its very existence. The colonized who are concerned for their country's culture and wish to give it a universal dimension should not place their trust in a single principle that independence is inevitable and automatically inscribed in the people's consciousness in order to achieve this aim. Uh, national liberation as objective is one thing. Uh, the methods and popular components of the struggle are another. We believe that the future of culture and the richness of a nation, national culture are also based on the values that inspire the struggle for freedom. You guys forgot to tell me to share my screen, but it's okay. I, we're almost finished. We only have two more pages. I read it. Yeah. We only have two more pages. Uh, and now, the unless, unless wait, Revolution Major, unless you want it, but I don't know. It seems no, like you guys are. Just listening. We're good. No, we're good. I like, I watch you on YouTube while we talk to make yeah. sure that I'm able to chat like quickly. Yeah, I, I figured. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I just, I just listen. I comment when you say something crazy. I never say anything crazy, so that's why you got no comments, right? Uh, <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> anyway, all right. And now, <laughs> you want to comment right now? <laughs> 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 Crazy. No. All right. And now the moment has come to denounce certain uh, Pharisees. Humanity, some say, I don't know what a Pharisee is. I mean, you guys know what Pharisee is. Uh, humanity, some say, has got past the stage of nationalist claims. The time has come to build larger political unions. No, it has You said what? No, it has No, no, no. He's talking about after liberation. Uh, Okay, but he's talking about global liberation or what? Like, no, 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 no. After your, like, for instance, like, like I said, after the American Revolution, you reach a new sure. stage in the nationalist uh, development. Or after this, you didn't need any more nationalist ideals, correct? You said what? That? Am I listening to that incorrectly? So there's no more need for a nationalistic ideal or identity. No, it basically is a new develop, new stage of it. You know, uh, once, okay. like, basically before the Taliban took over Kabul, right? they were probably communicating to themselves we gotta fight these americans we gotta and um, we're, we're we're an afghani people we gotta so and so forth but like like i said i think i guess i, I guess i didn't say it. i said in this uh in the harsh reality podcast so you guys make sure you check it out but uh like i said there or like i say there uh you know now that you have 40 million people in afghanistan or 4 million people in kabul you have to start you everything has to change you're no longer fighting the Americans and trying to take over from the Americans or defend yourself from the Americans. Now you have 4 million people you have to feed. Now you have 40 million people you have to clothe or, or, or provide energy for. Mm -hmm. and, 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 I mean, that's a task in and of itself. You know, everything yeah. about the culture before that, the culture before that was, let's get rid of these Americans. You know? Yeah. The culture before in Algeria was, let's get rid of these French the culture before inside of Haiti was let's get rid of these French. You know, you go around the world, French, French, French. No, but anyway, but like, but like realistically speaking, that was the culture before. But now you reach a different stage. You know, or for the Americans, it was get rid of these British. But now you reach a different stage. Now you have to govern. Now you have to be like the Ew. nation. Yeah, you have to sit Man. at the seat of powers. You have to decide who's going to. What's the formation? What's the body of law? You know, somebody asked uh, one of these Taliban people, would you respect women's rights? And they're like, yeah, we respect it within the boundaries of Islam. Uh, within the boundaries <laughs> of the Quran. You know? But, like, but like, that's the decision you have <laughs> to make. Laughing. Yeah. That, uh, oh, you said he laughed, right? I thought somebody said that he started laughing. They started laughing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, I mean, like, but, like, that's the decision you have to make. That's a real-life decision. You know, what do you do now when you're in charge? Because what you were doing when you weren't in charge was you were just trying to get into charge, get into power. Now that you were in power, what are you going to do with it? You know, that's a different stage. You, you, you don't talk about that. See, a lot of us talk about it before we get it. You know, we're like, yeah, man. So when we were in power, we're going to separate. And we're going to give everybody this gender, blah, blah, blah. And that's all. Well, fun when I and grow good. up, I'm going to have a gang of whips. I'm going to have a big house. 
I'm gonna do X, Y, Z. Then you grow up, you finally got bills. Oh yeah, true that. Uh, yeah. Okay, exactly. <laughs> we all know what you talk about, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> we heard that one. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I can't wait to live. Don't stay up. Hey, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna buy all this food. I'm gonna buy all this stuff. Oh yeah, true that, right? I'm yeah. Looking for yourself more. You gonna have lobster no every more. day. You ain't having lobster no days, man. Please, you oh. have more lobster. Growing up, you lucky yeah. your parents even you, gave you lobster. You have shrimp. You have shrimp. You, you lucky your mom and dad actually gave you lobster because you ain't damn sure you get no lobster now. <laughs> Shit. No, I'm just messing. Uh, anyway, but uh, uh, yeah, and saw the movement uh, has become. Yeah, so he says uh, humanity. Some say has gotten past the stage of nationalist claims. This time has come. Oh, oh, oh sorry. So he says some say. The time has come to build larger political unions, and consequently, the old-fashioned nationalists should correct their mistakes. We believe, on the contrary, that the mistake, heavy with consequences, would be to miss out on the national stage. If culture is the expression of the national consciousness, uh, so he says, culture is the expression of the national consciousness, I shall have no hesitation in saying, in case in point, that national consciousness is the highest form of culture. So, okay, so that, that's what he was saying right here. So, so, all right. He's saying that some people are going to say, we're, we're past the national stage, you know? And I guess he's talking about socialists, really. And he's like, we need to have larger political unions. We need to have, you know, African unions. We need to have uh, European unions. Or we need to is have that national in its way, anyway? Like, I'm lost. Yeah. Maybe I'm misinterpreting it. So. No, no, national, national is like just your nation. So a nation is just an administrative body, you know? Uh, 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 like, like, like the highest administrative body of the land. And what okay. he's saying when you have these unions is that you're saying that there's something even higher than that administrative body. You know, okay. uh, uh, and that right there is not uh, is not something that uh, we should uh, we should we should uh, we should Dude. we should go for. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I mean, he's saying that I you shouldn't go for that. Why you shouldn't? But okay. I mean, he's saying you shouldn't skip the nationalist stage. You shouldn't skip oh, the stage okay. of like forming a Nigeria before oh, forming okay. an African Union. Oh, like an African Union. Oh, okay. Yeah. I thought but, you meant like that. You shouldn't do that. You're like, bro, what? No, no, no. He's okay. saying because like people are saying. Like, because that's the thing that freaking, I mean, that, for instance, uh, uh, Nkrumah is saying, which was, you know, we shouldn't even develop nations. We should just go straight into uh, an African. The United States. Yeah, yeah 50, like, the, the United States of uh, Africa. Yeah. But, like, uh, I, I understand that part of it because, okay, mm-hmm. let's, let's say there's matron land in the south and chaka land in the east. Nah, I'm talking about the west. Only land. Nah, west only, that's not. Yeah. On, only land. Oh, sure. I was gonna give only the north. Okay, whatever. However, wherever you want to be. But let's say that we have all these different ideas, right, throughout the nation, right, throughout the continent of Africa. Just a theory. And all of the people, like in my land, don't necessarily agree with my idea, but I respect what they have going on, and their voice is heard. Because every man is the head of his house, every household converges to a group head man, and then those group head men, like, you know, like, unfortunately, like they set up judges and provinces in the Bible, where there were groups upon groups upon groups upon groups of people that all filtered up and down throughout a a centralized body that then said, okay, these are the answers, and this is how we handle this situation. Well, what was the question? And what was the, what was the? I mean, yeah, but why like, like we, you said, why can't we do that? Yeah, well, here's the thing. That's that's pretty much what he's saying in the sense that, uh, basically, the other way around. Basically, what you were describing was a bottoms up approach. You know, family building up the communities, building up to so on and so forth, right? And what what a lot of other people are promoting is a top down approach. You know, so as to say that you don't even have good families already. Right, but you have like a union of families. You know what I'm saying? Uh, like that, yeah. But like you know, like here in America, at least we saw that Reaganomics didn't work. Nothing trickles down. Exactly. Except except poop, and it just floats right back, and all the best of it floats right back up to the top to be the thing that peaks out and bothers us forever. But anyway, okay. What? I just wanted. I, I was just. What? <laughs> You know, they say hope flows. Like what? They say, they say that hope. No, I heard flows. you. I'm just trying to figure out why in the world you went so descriptive in poop. That was really <laughs> random. I was. 
sounds like a shitty situation to me. That's all I'm saying. She really was describing a shitty situation for real. All right, uh, that was different. Uh, all right, so let's keep going. Um, let's get the last chapter. Um, the last paragraph. So it says, self awareness does not mean closing the door on communication. Uh, uh, so self awareness is in you know your national consciousness. It does not mean like you being a nation doesn't mean that you close the door on other nations, right? Philosophy teaches us on the contrary that it is guaranteed. That is a guarantee. It's guaranteed. No, Jesus on the contrary that it is its guarantee. Uh, communication is a guarantee. National Ooh. consciousness, which is not nationalism, is alone capable of giving us an international dimension. You know, this question of national consciousness and national culture takes on a specific special dimension in Africa. The birth of national consciousness in Africa strictly correlates with an African consciousness so the birth of national consciousness in africa strictly correlates with an african consciousness the responsibility of the african toward his national culture is also a responsibility towards negro african culture this joint responsibility does not rest upon a metaphysical principle but mindfulness of a simple rule which stipulates that any independent nation in an africa where colonialism still lingers is a nation surrounded vulnerable and in permanent danger uh, Joint responsibility does not rest upon a metaphysical principle, but mindfulness of a simple rule which stipulates that any independent nation in Africa where colonialism still lingers is a nation surrounded, vulnerable, and apparent. So he's like, if if you have an independent African nation, right, you're still vulnerable, notwithstanding if there is a nation in Africa that is under colonialism, you know? So he's saying, look, I'm not abandoning pan-Africanism, Right? I'm not saying don't go for pan africans I'm not saying do not fight against the, uh, 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 I'm not saying, you know, just worry about you, you know, you're free, not just saying, worry about, about, you. about you. Yeah, exactly. I'm saying worry about you, but, but also realize that uh, if you do, like, like you worrying about you means that you have to also decolonize other nations in Africa. It's like if everybody in your neighborhood and on your one street, all your neighbors are getting robbed. I mean, yeah, you good, but like eventually, you the one place that hasn't got robbed yet. Yeah, yeah. exactly. You know, or, or or even like more realistically speaking, you know, if white boys taking over all the houses, you know, in your neighborhood. Education. Yeah, yeah, your that's house true. is next. You know, clearly. They gonna either like, give if, you an if, offer. Yeah, exactly. If you your property tax. You said what? They gonna give you an offer or up your property tax. Yeah, if if you if you don't stick up for your neighbor, it's it's gonna be you next. You know, uh, or, or you basically have white folk have a platform where they can attack you from, you know, because uh, now they in your they in your neighborhood. Uh, and so he's just saying, yeah, you do want to decolonize. doesn't mean that you're going to go straight and say, OK, now we're going to give all this administration to somewhere else. You know, because remember this, that what Pan-Africanism might look like to some people, like if you had a super nation, uh, if you had a super nation, uh let's say the size of West Africa, right? Then you're gonna have one capital, right? It don't matter where you put that capital, the people who are not in that region are gonna feel, are possibly gonna feel neglected. If, if, and here's the worst part, if the nations are not so developed, then uh, it's a question whether that capital can develop those nations, you know? Now, maybe it could. And, 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 you know, it would take a nice, you know, really smart person to do so. Uh, yeah, like me. You said what? Like, like me. Yeah, like, like, um, like Umchaka. But, uh, cap, anyway. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but the thing is that, you know, uh, I, I think that it could be done. I think if we were really serious, we, we could do it. Uh, but I understand if people do not believe so. You know, I understand if people don't believe so. Because, you know, all evidence is to the contrary. But anyway, uh, thank you so much, family. It's been uh, wonderful having you all. Uh, it's been real. It's been real, you know. Thank you for joining me. This was a nice 12 pages. Uh, like I said, so, so uh, Monday, I'm going to be a little late. So it might be like three or uh -oh. four. What you got going on, man? Right? Uh, so it might be a little later. Uh, other than that, though, uh, uh, you know, I'll go back to the regular schedule on Tuesdays and then. Uh, so, so I know because Machiavelli would tell me I'm gonna be late if I'm after eleven. Oh, so I'm just gonna see if you go on three, you're gonna be on African time, not even CP time. I know, right? Sure. I, I just got I, 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 I got a link with uh, Fanon. You know, you got you gotta you gotta make it a little African. Uh, <laughs> but uh, 
<laughs> but other than that, yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I appreciate you guys for coming through, and uh, hopefully I'll hear from you guys Saturday. Saturday, I'm also, I mean Sunday, sorry, Sunday, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make it a premiere. You know, I'm not gonna be live, live. Oh, so, premiere. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm actually, I think I'm gonna talk about the Haiti, the Haiti thing, the Haiti article. Uh, I'm just a gonna premiere or a live, which is it? premiere, bro. Uh, okay. But, but anyway, but other than that, we'll chat. And thank you so much for joining me. Shamiam Hotep. Peace.